All right, so it is started. So let's jump into our microbiology capstone review. Um, I'm going to leave it in this format because I need to be able to type in things. So back to the very, very basics of microbiology, of course, gram staining. So you guys have done gram staining a lot by now. We did it a lot in class and hopefully you've done it at your site. Um, so there's four steps, as we all know, crystal violet, iodine, decolorizer, saffronin. The goal of gram staining is to not only tell us if it's gram positive or negative, but also to tell us the morphology or shape of the bacteria. So we can have coxy or rod bacilli, which are most common, or cacobacilli, and then spirilli would be the third technical shape there. For acid fast dating, I don't, a lot of you probably didn't get to do this because it is more specialized, and maybe some of you did if you had a larger micro lab, which would be amazing. Um, there are three reagents to the acid fast stain, carbal fuchsin, decolorizer, then methylene blue. There were two techniques, either the Zeal Nielsen or the Kenyan. Remember, Zeal Nielsen is the one that uses heat, a boiling technique. Kenyan is what we call the cold method. It took out the boiling step, added more phenol instead into, and that way they didn't have to heat it up. Again, you're looking for acid fast bacteria, which would be mainly mycobacteria we look for in this. Um, which would turn a red color from the carbal fuchsin, or if they're non acid fast, they would just remain blue. And then, as far as fluorescent dyes go, and again, these are unique to every lab. Some labs might use them, other labs might be a smaller micro department and not use them. So, we have acridine orange, oramine rhodamine, and calcofluor white. Does anybody remember what acridine orange will bind to? So, what does a target and bind? Oh, you did get to. Somebody did get to do this. That's good. Uh, it is cool if you can do it. It's usually a pretty large micro department um, that gets to use these. I've worked in micro departments that never had fluorescent dyes, so it was always disappointing. <laughs> All right, so I did have an answer here. Um, so acridine orange will bind to the nucleic acid. So a lot of times this is used for a couple of different reasons. I think the main purpose a lot of labs use it is in blood cultures to kind of scan, like if there's a positive blood culture to scan and see if there is bacteria present. Another reason to do it is if you have mycoplasma, mycoplasma, remember, does not have a wall, so you can't gram stain mycoplasma, but you can use acridine orange and it'll bind to um, the nucleic acids in that bacteria and highlight that they are there. So just kind of a couple different purposes. I know I think from what I've learned from different people in different labs, a lot of people use it for the blood culture part with acridine orange. Um, all right, or I mean rhodamine, this is the one that binds to mycolic acids. So again, another tool to use for looking for mycobacteria. So that will bind to the mycolic acids in mycobacteria. And then who remembers calcifluor white? That one is the one that people tend to remember better. Yes, good. I see you guys are answering here. Perfect. Yep, that is our fungi cell wall chitin one. So I always think of calcifluor as cauliflower, and I don't know why, but that makes me think of fungus then, because it probably looks more like a fungus as a vegetable than anything else. So yeah, that one is for fungi, for yeast, things like that. Okay, back to augers. Oh my gosh, there's so many augers. We can't possibly cover them all. I know that when you guys went to your micro rotations, every lab decides what augers they want to use. Some labs you know, we'll use the very basic ones. Some will have some additional extra ones. You probably have maybe even saw augers where you're like, I never learned this auger. That's because there's so many out there. <laughs> we had to narrow down what we teach. Um, but of course, number one auger most commonly used is the blood auger. We need to remember the categories we put everything in because um, that helps you remember what they do, the purpose of them. So there's always four different categories to augers. Supportive, meaning they'll pretty much grow almost anything. They're supportive. They support the growth. Enrichment, added nutrients to help grow those fastidious organisms, especially that want extra stuff. Selective, meaning they're only going to grow a gram negative or a gram positive. They're selecting between them. And then differential, basically they're looking at other characteristics that they can highlight from the bacteria, like fermenters or something. Okay. So let's kind of go through some of these. Blood auger would be what, anybody remember any of the categories for blood auger? There is two, I'll tell you that. 
Good. And for sure, we definitely have supportive. So, I mean, that's why we use Blonogra for almost every culture setup because it is so good and supportive. The second uh, category here is definitely differential. So, and it's differential. Why is it differential? Actually, I want you guys to tell me why it's differential. Yes, it is differential based on hemolysis patterns on this one. So if a bacteria is beta hemolytic, alpha hemolytic, or gamma hemolytic, meaning no hemolysis. So hopefully when you're in micro, you always, you know, when you look at colony morphology, you should always be looking, does it have a hemolysis and commenting if it does. So, all right, let's go to chocolate auger. What two categories would we want to put chocolate auger into? Yeah, so good. Definitely, we know it's enrichment because chocolate is the one that we can grow those fastidious organisms like Haemophilus or Neisseria. So we know it's enriched and it is supportive because they'll basically grow everything. It's just like blood agar, except the red cells get hemolyzed upon making it. That's what makes it look chocolatey and it releases out those extra nutrients so that we can grow some of those picky bacteria. So it's supportive and enrichment. DNA agar. It is one category only. What is that? Good, yes, definitely selective. And somebody already answered it, selective for gram positive bacteria. Perfect. McConkey agar, what two categories would you put this one into? Yes. Is definitely selective and differential, selective for gram negatives in this case. So, a lot of labs will use McConkey. If they're not using McConkey, it's because they're using EMB auger instead. So, I don't have EMB on this page here, but EMB auger would be the same purpose as McConkey selective and differential, looking for gram negatives. And when those gram negatives grow, they can put them into lactose fermentation categories. So, if it's a lactose fermenter on McConkey, it'll show up like a purpley color. If it's a non-lactose fermenter, it'll be clear. So, PEA agar. And this one is just selective. Yep, so same purpose as DNA, growing gram pauses, um, so again, a lot of labs will have one or the other. They'll either have a CNA or the HPEA. There is a mixture of the two. I think they call it a rose auger plate. Maybe a lot, one of your guys' labs had that, where it's like a CNA and PEA kind of mixed plate, and they call it a rose auger. Um, it's kind of a fun name. All right, Hactoin and Teric HE auger, two categories. Good, yes, it is selective, it is differential. Yes, good. So, selective, why? What is it growing? What is HGR growing? Why do we use it? There you go, yes, yeah, salmonella and shigella, good. So we are screening for salmonella and shigella specifically, and those are gram-negative rods. So AG is selective because it's gonna grow the, what we call enteric gram-neg rods. So specifically looking salmonella and shigella, the GI bacteria, exactly. So enteric meaning intestinal. And then it's differential, again, based on fermentation. Salmonella and shigella are both non-fermenters. So when they grow on HE agar, they will be blue in color. 
So whenever we grow on like a stool culture out onto H.E. agar, we're screening for blue colonies then. And if we do have some, they can work them up and determine if it's Salmonella or Shigella. Okay. Thioglycolate broth is actually two categories. What do we got? Yes, it is supportive, it is enriched, good. Very good, supportive and enriched. So, thio is very similar to like blood agar except in liquid form. It'll support the growth of pretty much almost anything. And so a lot of times it's just a good extra thing to set up because it will also potentially grow anaerobes toward the bottom of the tube if that might be an anaerobe. So a lot of times like with wound cultures, if you get a wound culture and they might set up a wound culture to mix, like several plates, blood, chocolate, like a CNA or PA and a macaque or EMB, because we don't know what could be causing the wound infection. And then they might throw on an anaerobe plate if it is a deep enough wound. And a lot of places, like when I worked micro, we always had a thio broth set up with the wound culture. Cause again, it could be a lot of different stuff possibly happening in that wound. We don't know, it's a guessing game. So let's set up to possibly grow something. So thio is just a good, extra supportive and enriched um, little tube of goodness, I guess you could say. I'm running out of words here. So supportive and enrichment for thio broth. XLD auger is the exact same purpose as HE. So again, looking for salmonella and shigella. I know somebody had mentioned that earlier. So it is selective and differential again on this one, screening for that salmonella and shigella. In this case, salmonella and shigella will be clear colonies on that XLD agar as non-fermenters. Now, one little tip again, that salmonella can produce some H2S, so it might have like a black center to the colony because of that H2S production. And let's do Thayer Martin. What two categories would we put Thayer Martin in? This is a one that's a little like an oddball. Yes, it is. We always want to say superb and rich because we think like those seem to go together so well, but it's selective and enrichment. So I saw so like, yep. So we got the answers here. It's just selective and enriched. And it is selective for what? What are we looking for? Good. We are looking for Neisseria. So it's selectively just growing that little gramnig diplococci, that's Neisseria. And if you remember, Neisseria, of course, is fastidious, picky. So we know it has to be enriched as well to make sure that Neisseria grows. Again, Thayer Martin has all those antibiotics in it to make sure nothing else but hopefully the Neisseria is growing. So it's got that colistin, vancomycin, trimethoprim, and Nystatin in it to screen out everything else and just let the Nysteria thrive. The other one that's similar to this is Martin Lewis. Um, that will also have different, have antibiotics in it. Remember, that's the one that uses mycin instead of the Nystatin, but otherwise it's pretty much the same, looking for Nysteria. There is a third one. I can't remember if I ever said this in the original lecture, but it's NYC auger. Um, so I was like, NYC New York City is what I think of when I hear that. So my saying has always been, and it's not a nice saying, but the two Martins, so Thayer Martin, Martin Lewis, go to New York City and get gonorrhea. Um, so that always helped me remember those three all together, we're looking for nice area. Okay, let's move on. So we had a lot of other augers that we have learned. Um, a lot of these on this page, we don't want to, we don't have to worry about categorizing these into other categories. We're just gonna remember, what did they grow? Like, what did we use these for? What was the purpose of these specialty augers? And again, not every lab is gonna use all of these or they'll use other ones that I don't have on here. 
So let's start with cysteine telluride. Does anybody remember what that R is for? That's usually one of the harder ones on this list for people to remember. All right. Never mind. Aubrey remembered it right away. It is Crini bacterium diphtheriae. Um, so cysteine telluride, really good for Crini bacterium diphtheriae. Middlebrook, what did that grow? I can never tell if people are actually typing or not. It's okay if you don't want to answer. I just can't see if anybody's in the middle of answering or not. All right, this one is a little tricky. Um, so Middlebrook is used for mycobacteria. Mycobacteria. Okay, this one should be better. Four day and go. Yes, good. Bordetella pertussis. Yep, whooping cough. Perfect. Tinsdale auger. It is cranibacterium diphtheriae again, yep. So cranibacterium diphtheriae will get a really unique look on Tinsdale auger. That's the one where it has the brown halo. So that's one of its key features. Yep, you were typing it as I said it, yes. So cranibacterium diphtheriae will get that brown halo in Tinsdale, and that's a very unique feature to diphtheriae and to separate it from others. Okay, and there is a third Cranibacterium diphtheriae auger that we didn't mention on this list, and that would be Lechler's. Um, so that would be, there were three that we had mentioned. I know that one of these isn't really used at all anymore, and I wonder if it's, it's either the cysteine telluride or the Lechler's that isn't used anymore. I can't remember why. Is, oh. I'm trying to type it out, and apparently I'm struggling. There it is. So that's the third one. One of them is kind of obsolete now, but I just remember them all just to be safe. So all three of those are for cranibacterium diphtheriae. Okay, thin auger, C-I-N. Good. It is Yersinia, which is nice because sin is right in the word Yersinia, so it kind of goes together that way. So Yersinia enteropoetica will have those bullseye or target-shaped colonies when it grows on sin auger. CCFA. I always think people are not going to remember this one, but you guys do really well with it. It is C. diff, Clostridium difficile. And so C. diff will be yellow colonies when it grows on CCFA. Of course, in micro world, we don't really grow out Clostridium difficile. We use, um, there's kit tests, or molecular is the most popular way to detect C. diff, looking for the toxins that it produces. Number seven, Lowenstein Jennings. Yes, so that is mycobacteria as well. That one people remember better. So Middlebrook and Lowenstein Jennings are both used for mycobacteria. Max Sorbitol. Very good. It is E. coli O157 specifically. Um, yes, it's a great screening tool for that enterohemorrhagic E. coli strain. And again, that strain, 
I just had a brain fart, will show up as clear colonies. Clear colonies, right? Yeah. Because they are not a they are a non fermenter of sorbitol. Other E. coli strains ferment sorbitol. E. coli 157 does not. So that's why they use this as a screening tool. Okay, Manitol salt agar. Look at you guys. It is Staph aureus, and Staph aureus will be yellow colonies on Manitol salt agar. BCYE. Very good. It's Legionella. Yep. Looking for Legionella. So that's the one that's buffered charcoal yeast extract, and then it has that extra cysteine and iron in it for the Legionella to grow. Um, yes, Francisella can grow on there too. Yeah, good. We did have that as a question on a study guide. Yeah. We always talk about it mainly for Legionella, but I forget to say that Francisella will grow on it as well. Good. TCBS. Yeah, looking for Vibrio, specifically Vibrio cholera. Good. And finally, BBE. That's okay. So this one is BBE is full of bile and bacteroides love to grow on bile. So it means the presence of bile. Yep. So it's bacteroides, which bacteroides is your number one anaerobe besides like rule of C diff stuff. <laughs> um, as far as anaerobic infections, other than the C diff, it is your biggest cause of anaerobic infections. Bad. It's very yucky smelling. Well, all anaerobes are yucky smelling, but okay. Let's go into all the, our different organisms. So we're going to start with our grandpa's organisms, and we're going to start with the staff. So we're going to fill out these little charts together, kind of just highlighting some, trying to move my chat box around here, just some key features on each one. We can't talk about everything, but we can talk about some key things. So we already know these are gram pauses and they're all gram pause coxy. So we don't need to write out the gram stain. So you should all know by now staph is gram positive coxy. Very first test that we're going to run on staph when we know it's a gram pause coxy. What's the first test? Yes, it'll definitely be a catalase test. And staph are very much catalase what? Good, catalase positive. Yeah, so staph aureus, of course, would be catalase positive. What is the next test we would run once we know that? Yeah, coagulase. So I'm just gonna write coag and staph aureus would be coag. And it would be coag positive. Good. So that is a huge feature, Staph aureus. It, I mean, there are a few staphs that could be coag variable, but Staph aureus is just strongly coagulase positive. Remember, there is two different coagulase types of testing, um, the slide and the tube. So sometimes they use one to confirm the other. So some of your facilities might have done both, and some of your facilities might have only just done one type of coag test. Okay, I'm going to leave that alone for now. As far as diseases goes, oh my gosh, so much, basically. Uh, it causes a lot. I mean, everything from wound infections to UTIs to a pneumonia, um, it basically can be a pathogen almost always. We're always screening for staph aureus on pretty much any type of culture, other than maybe 
stool culture. We always screen for staph aureus. Um, one note here is, of course, MRSA. And I bet some of your facilities, a lot of hospitals will do MRSA screening on their patients. Um, when they're admitting patients into the hospital, they might do a MRSA screen on them right away. So maybe some of your labs had like special auger plates set up to screen for MRSA. I know IEC is a chrome auger and we would scan for a certain colony um, color to see and then test that to see if that was MRSA. There might be other, of course, there's other augers out there. So that might have been something you guys did in micro. Um, and some people do that as a QA project. They might do it for a while as a quality assurance project and then not do it after that and then just kind of kick it in gear here and there. But MRSA, of course, is methicillin resistant staph aureus. So this is the one that we would treat with vancomycin commonly. Um, if they are on MRSA, there are a few VRSAs out there, VRSA, which are also resistant to vancomycin. Um, I don't believe there's not there's that many cases of that though. There's it's pretty rare still. So as far as other stuff goes, Staph aureus is found as normal flora in the nares, and that is where they can screen for that MRSA. So they might take a swab, just swab the nostril area, grow it out because Staph aureus is normally found there. So they know staph aureus will grow it, and then if it's MRSA, they can look for the different colony color on those auger plates to see. So um, staph aureus can be a little bit found on some of the skin. Not It's not a huge skin flora, but it can be a little bit there as well. And then around the perennial anal area too, or some of the other areas that it might be found on normal flora. Uh, I think that's all I want to say. Oh. And then remember, colony morphology-wise for Staph aureus, very much typically beta hemolytic. Of course, every strain can possibly be different, but it's usually beta hemolytic. It's larger, medium to large colonies, creamy. All staphs are a little bit larger, creamier colonies. Um, and then this is the one they named aureus, AU on the periodic table, gold, because it's said to kind of sometimes have that yellowy, buttery gold look to it, if you will. Um, so maybe you saw that it's not always picture perfect on that. It might be very light or it might be just like a creamy white kind of look to you. Um, depends on how you interpret it and how it grows. Every strain again can be different. So that's the typical look for staph aureus. All right, going down to staph intermediates, again, grandpa's coxy. First test we're gonna run is catalase. It is a staph, so we already know it's catalase positive. We can then do our coagulase test next. And what is a coagulase result for staph intermediates? Yes, good. So is Cali pause, coag, variable. So can be coagulase pause, could be coagulase negative. But this is one of the few that is coagulase interchangeable, I guess. So this is the one that we've talked about other testing to help separate. If you did a PYR test, this would be positive versus up on your staph aureus, PYR would be negative. My equal signs are negative, just so you guys know. That's just drilled in me from years ago. <laughs> so PYR negative for staph aureus. So that'll help separate between them. I know we discussed the VP test. That's more of a gram negative test, but you can still apply that rule there too. Um, I'll put it on here because we always learned it, but VP Boproscar tends to be a gram negative test, but I'm gonna put it on there so you can see. Okay, staph intermediates, we kind of linked it with one thing and what was that? Again, it can always show up with other stuff possibly, but what did it tend to be linked with? Good. Yep, dog bite infections. All right, so we're good there. Let's go to staph epidermidus, which you probably saw quite a bit of as well. Catalase positive, because it is a gram pos coxy staph. Coagulase, what is our coagulase result for staph epi? Good, coagulase negative. Okay, I'm gonna leave it alone for a second on that. We'll come back and add. Um, staph epi, we know it's a huge normal flora of skin, and mucous membrane. So a lot of times with contamination, if it's found like 
If you draw blood cultures and only one blood culture out of four came up positive in a staph epi, that's contamination from not cleaning the site well enough because it's such a big normal flora of the skin. We might see it as contamination on a UTI, like, like a urine culture, if it just shows up a little bit, not heavily, like that's contamination because they didn't clean well enough collecting that urine, things like that. But if it does cause disease, what did we link it with? Yeah, so prosthetics, medical devices, good. So, and the reason for this, again, is one of the virulence factors for staph epi is it can make a biofilm. And you should look at biofilms. I love them. They're gross, but I love them. <laughs> um, they can get on so many different things. If you ever see a kitchen sponge biofilm, you'll never use them again. I don't use them. Um, so, biofilms, meaning they make this slime capsule that protects them, and it's so hard to get rid of once it's on there because it has this, like, really good slime capsule that's just so impossible to get rid of and it keeps all that little staph epi or whatever else might be in there really you know kept nice and tidy and so on these medical devices if that's happening and they are able to hear on there when they insert that medical device into that person then it's there and it can cause infection so like a prosthetic heart valve that could possibly cause like an infection of the heart or something um, as a result. So, of course, we're hoping they're sterilizing, doing all their stuff in their sterile processing department on these things and getting rid of things like that. But they can be really tricky, those little biofilms. And so there are certain bacteria that can make them and Staph epi is one of them. Okay, Staph saprophyticus, we already know it's gram coxy, catalase positive because it's a Staph. What is the coag result for Staph sapro? Yep, very much coag negative. Now, there's a lot of coag negative staff. There's way more. Obviously, I didn't put that many on here. I mean, we have hiatus, lung denensis. Like, there's so many staffs out there. We just couldn't. But one way we know staff saprophyticus from the rest of the staff, coag negative staff, is novobiosin. What result is staff saprophyticus for novobiosin if we put a novobiosin disc on there? Yes, very much resistant. You could say negative. Yep. Whereas staph epidermidis and a lot of the other coagnase staphs are susceptible to it. So that can kind of help separate between a bunch of coagnase staphs and staph sapro. The disease that we link with staph saprophyticus? Yep. Pretty much UTIs, mainly in females. And that is, again, Yep, because of normal flora of the genital urinary tract. So if they're not cleansing well enough, especially upon sexual activity and it's inserting it more in there, um, then they could flare up and cause a UTI. All right, last one. Um, so again, you guys probably saw other staffs in the micro department. Again, they are there, um, we just can't go through them all. But let's talk about micrococcus. It is grouped together with the staff category because it is a gram coxy and it is catalase positive. So it shares some sim similar traits there. Um, when you go to coag tested, it will be coag negative. And then it doesn't really cause disease. It's extremely rare for it to show up as a disease causer. So it's pretty much contamination. That's because again, it is a huge normal flora of the skin, mucous membranes. It's very low virulence factors. That's why it doesn't really cause disease. It doesn't have a lot of like disease causing ability. It doesn't make toxins or anything like that, really. So, and then the other unique feature is it can be a lot of different colors on an auger plate. I've seen it be tan, white, orange. Um, so it's just one that you'll see pop up here and there. So that's why we always discuss it because it is a contaminant, especially like on a UTI or something like that. All right, so there's our staff. And again, when I send you the park mice today, I'll send the blank version of this. And then I have one filled out from a previous time of doing these capstones that I'll send that's already filled out with some of this. It might look a little bit different than how I typed it today, but it'll have basically the same info in it. Um, so I will send that to you guys as well as a filled out version. All right, let's move over to our streps. Now we know these are all still grandpa's coxies. Um, strep, some things here. Huge about the hemolysis pattern because hemolysis pattern on this will help determine what types of tests we want to perform. 
And then some of the stress get named with a landfill group based on the carbohydrate it might have on its surface. So a little couple extra parts here. So let's go through here, um, starting with streptogenes. What is its landfill group? Yeah, so we definitely call it group A. So a lot of times in the lab, you'll say group A strep, meaning strep pyogenes, um, or they use GAS for short, group A strep. What is its hemolysis? It is very much beta hemolytic. I, so streps tend to be smaller colonies than staph. So I always said staph is kind of more of like that's okay. Um, they're always more of a medium-sized colony. Streps tend to be a little bit smaller. Strep pyogenes tend to be a little bit bigger, but they tend to be small for the most part. Um, but again, it is a gram poscoxy. So, of course, we're still going to catalase test it because it is gram poscoxy. It's the first test we always run. Catalase what on streps? Good. Okay, Lori. You can't type. Catalase negative, yes. So, once we know we have a gram poscoxy, catalase negative, we're already thinking about streps. Then you can look at the colony morphology and the hemolysis. So, it's like, okay, now it's beta hemolytic, and that will determine our next set of tests. So, what other tests could we run here for strep pyogenes? Good. Your bacitracin disc. Yep, and somebody did put the result there. It will be very much bacitracin susceptible. All right. Is there anybody else, any other tests that you guys want to do? I mean, that is the biggest one for strep pyogenes, but there's some. You could run CAMP. What would be the CAMP results? Okay, good. There's CAMP negative. Um, if you did hit B-rate hydrolysis, that would also be negative. Okay. And then I'm going to come back and add one more thing in a little bit here, but I'm going to leave it alone for that. Diseases, again, it's like staph aureus. It's just always a pathogen. It just causes so many things um, from skin infections to, of course, strep throat is the big one, what we call pharyngitis. Um, so you should run that on a strep kit or maybe have a little molecular analyzer looking for strep from strep throat. Um, two that we're going to name specifically, rheumatic fever and acute glomerulonephritis. Those are what we call post-strep complications or post-strep infections. So somebody may have had a strep pyogenes infection and then as part of fighting that off, making antibodies, all that, they have caused damage to either their heart with rheumatic fever or their kidneys with acute glomerulonephritis. So that results from fighting off the strep pyogenes infection. So it's what we call post-streptococcal diseases, but we still link it with strep pyogenes because that's why it came about. Um, lots of other things though, scarlet fever, um, so many other diseases. It's just always a pathogen. It is not really normal flora in our body. So it's one that we always screen for. Um, and then it has a ton of virulence factors. This is the one that has all those virulence factors that we've learned about. Um, M protein, hyaluronidase, streptokinase, I can't type as I talk, and so on and so forth. So you had to tell you guys that we filled out on that. So I'll let you guys refer back to all that. Okay, strep A galactiae, Lancefield group. Very good. B, hemolysis. Yes, it is beta hemolytic. So we already know it's gram poscoxy. It is catalase negative because it's a strep A galactiae, or it's a strep it's negative. So what, then we look back at the auger, we see it's beta hemolytic. We can run the exact same test as we ran on strep pyogenes because it's a catalase negative beta hemolytic gram poscoxy. Oops, don't type that out. <laughs> yes, it's bacitracin resistant. 
If we ran camp, it would be camp C needs to type. Okay. So it's camp positive. And if we ran hip urate hydrolysis, that's also positive. So you can see right there from those three tests, we can figure out off our beta hemolytic straps, which one's strep hyalgene, which one's strep A lactate. That's the whole purpose of running these tests is to figure out which one it is specifically. So very good. All right, diseases, naming the big disease that we linked with it. Yeah, good, meningitis, specifically in newborns, especially, and that's why I've always said group B for babies. So neonatal meningitis, good. Um, so this is the one, if you worked in a medical center that also had a clinic that saw pregnant women, at around 28 weeks, they should be swabbed to screen to see if they naturally carry strep A lactate in their vaginal tract. If they do, then we can give them antibiotics, clear it out, so that way, upon giving birth, they hopefully do not pass it to the baby and have the risk of neonatal meningitis. Um, if any of you did that there, a lot of times what they do is they put that swab into like carrot broth or limb broth. Did anybody do that? Have one of those broths that they threw it in? And those broths will kind of clear out the rest of the vaginal flora. Uh, limb broth. So somebody used limb broth. Yep. I know when I worked in my last one, we used limb broth as well. So what those broths do, limb broth or tear broth, is they'll clear out all the other vaginal normal flora. So that way the strep is there kind of thrives and we can see it. So yeah. So that's kind of a common practice if you have clinic specimens coming in and it's a clinic that sees pregnant women commonly. Okay. Going to Strep pneumonia, Lansfield group. Well, it's a trick question. There is no Lansfield group. So, apologize if that was confusing. You're probably like, what? <laughs> so, no Lansfield group for strep pneumonia. What is the hemolysis? Yes, well, now we're switching gears. It is alpha hemolytic very much. So we will still catalyze that because it's a gram pos proxy and still catalase negative on that strep pneumonia. Now, when we look back at the agar plate, we're like, okay, we have an alpha hemolytic catalase negative. What test could we run here? Yeah, so the optican, or maybe some people say optichin disc, and it would be susceptible. Remember, they call this the P disc. Yeah, susceptible. Um, the bacitracin one, by the way, was called the A disc. A lot of times when you put it on, it should have an A on there on the optichin or optican. It should have a P on it. So think of P for pneumonia, A for group A. That's kind of why they nickname them. them. Okay, so yes, very much optican susceptible for strep pneumonia. There is another test that we could list here. What would it be? Or does anyone have ideas? Yes, biosolubility. And this would very much be biosolubility positive. Good. Okay. Two diseases that we have linked with strep pneumonia. One should be kind of more obvious from the name. What do we got? Definitely pneumonia. Again, it is the number one cause of pneumonia. And the other good is meningitis. So some very big, scary diseases that we've linked with it. Um, a couple of things, or at least for sure one other thing. We already said this is grandpa's coxie, but 
sharp pneumonia is the one that's grand positive diplococci, so it occurs in pairs. So they are said to be what we call cat eye shaped or lancet shaped. It doesn't matter if you can see that particular part. If you're seeing grand positive pairs, you should start already thinking, especially on a sputum, which we would use sputum to screen for pneumonia, or on a CSF looking for meningitis, that's your right away trigger. This might be strep pneumonia because that's a big pathogen in those. Uh, gram positive diplococci on that strep pneumonia. Okay, viridin and strep, also no lancetal group. Again, viridin and strep is just a ton of other alpha hemolytic straps that just, we throw it all together and call them viridins under one group name, but they have individual strains. Um, you can sometimes call it group D. This gets confusing to people because we also call group D strep bovis. Um, as part of that, and then sometimes people still call enterococcus group D. So strep bovis especially has been thought, oh no, that's group C. What am I saying? I see it's too early sometimes for me. I'm sorry. Group C is strep bovis. Um, so yeah, you can call viridins group D, but some people also throw in enterococcus and call that group D. It gets a little like hairy there with what text will say. Um, so you can know it either way. I'm glad you guys said that. So both work for me, but just know that sometimes people might think of enterococcus as under that group D setting too. And maybe they don't as much anymore, but all right, viridins, alpha. So we're gonna run those same tests that we ran on strep pneumonia. So it's still catalase negative because they're strep. If we did the optican, what is our optican result here? Yes, it is resistant, good. And if you ran the biosolubility, what would your result be there? Why can't I type? Yes, negative. So you can see right there, those tests will help separate between the alpha hemolytic streps, or at least all these other little streps from strep pneumonia, which is a big pathogen. Okay, so for diseases, um, mainly we've linked endocarditis and dental kind of infections, dental caries with a viridin strep group. As always with any of these, there's so much, there's other things. We just are trying to highlight the big bad boys. Everything can cause a bacteremia. I, I think I said that in my original lectures. You can always have a sepsis with bacteria if they get into your bloodstream um, and they can thrive, they will do that. So just always keep that in the back of your mind. Don't say it's exclusively this, we're just highlighting the main things that we've linked it with. Okay, and now let's go down to enterococcus. So enterococcus in general has been grouped to the straps because they are gram pos cocci. They tend to be catalase negative or the weak positive. Um, but overall, they share some very similar features as straps. So that's why we just group them together under this um, thing. So that would be cool to see bacteria in a peripheral smear. That's a bad infection. Ooh. Yeah, that would be neat. And sometimes you might even, I know I'm getting off topic here, but you might see like the, re, did you see the neutrophils kind of look really funky because they're doing their phagocytic stuff then? Sometimes you might see, start to see the neutrophils get like vacuolated or they get really kind of weird looking um, as they respond to bacterial infections like that. I don't know if that was part of that smear, if that was seen yet but sometimes you can see bacteria responding or neutrophils responding. Okay, so back to enterococcus. As far as hemolysis goes, this one is a tricky one because it could be any type of hemolysis. It could be beta, alpha, or gamma, no hemolysis. Um, so that's where we have a little bit of a hodgepodge of testing here. If you, we're suspecting, like, so if it was, say, beta hemolytic, you could run your peat bacitracin thinking maybe it's just pyogenes or A galaxiae. Um, it would be bacitracin resistant. It would be negative for the others. But if you were to run a PYR, it would be PYR positive, whereas strep pyogenes up here is PYR negative. So that would help separate it from the others up here. 
So if it's a beta hemolytic PYR, it can help separate it out. If it's alpha hemolytic, it is biosolubility negative. But if you're to run bioesculin, it is positive, whereas these guys up here are bioesculin negative. So that will help separate it out. Um, and it also likes to grow in 6.5% NACL broth. That is positive. So it has, you just have to kind of um, look at the source always and think of what pathogens you're looking for. And then hemolysis with this, and you can kind of use, it just depends what this one. This one's a little trickier. It's not as nicely categorized because of the hemolysis patterns. But what we mainly linked with um, enterococcus in general is nosocomial infections, especially UTIs. So that's basically what it's kind of been linked with. Hey, all right. I think that's all I want to mention there. Let's go on to our grandpa's rods. So all of these are grandpa's rods because we're still under the grandpa's category. So your bacillus species, the two big ones that we discussed were bacillus anthracis, bacillus serious. There's a lot of other bacillus strains, but all the rest of them are pretty not pathogenic. They're normal flora. We don't see a lot of stuff with them. So we know they're grandpa's rods. Remember bacillus anthracis and serious are the ones that are, they're very large. The box car, we call it train. They should stand out and jump out to you so much when you have it. And then they are spore forming. So I'm going to put spore plus there because they can form a spore. So both, all the cells can have that ability. Okay. As far as testing goes, we didn't have a lot here that we had to link with it. Um, for separating between them, I have other, okay. One thing is motility. The cell synthesis has what motility reaction? Is it modal or non-modal? Oh, and I'm going to come back to that, what you mentioned there. Yes. It is non-modal, whereas the cell serious is modal. So that will help separate. I know some cells mentioned penicillin. So if you threw on like a penicillin disc to look for susceptibility or resistance, the cell synthesis is what penicillin reaction? Yep, it's definitely penicillin susceptible, whereas the cell serious is penicillin resistant. Okay, and then if you were to look, I'm going to move my chart back here, at the morphology of these. Bacillus anthracis is non-hemolytic, because I always say the nons go together, non-modal, non-hemolytic. And then this is the one that has what we call the Medusa head or comma projections. They're large colonies. They're not nice and circular. They always have some weird projections kind of happening. Whereas Bacillus serious is beta hemolytic. Still a large colony. We call it more spreading, though. It doesn't have, like, those projections quite like anthracis does. And going back, disease, the nice thing about bacillus anthracis is named for what it causes, or the disease is named for the bacteria, anthrax. We did learn, of course, that you have those three different types of anthrax infections, so skin, um, gastrointestinal, so if you were to ingest it, and then, of course, the big bioterrorism one that we think about is respiratory. So typically in respiratory, we're looking at usually more of a bioterrorism type situation, but that doesn't mean it can't happen, it can. There's been cases of respiratory anthrax that had nothing to do with bioterrorism. Once in a while, it can pop up like that. So this is the one that they've nicknamed wolf starters. So I talked about that where the sheep graze and because the anthrax can be found in the soil and they can get those spores caught up into their wool, and then upon shearing and handling them, the wool sorters, the workers, could possibly get an infection, like especially if they had an opening on their skin, then it would cause that skin infection, or if they were to inhale it, that kind of thing. So, 
And then bacillus cereus, what did we link for disease here? Yes. So the main thing I think we all think about is food poisoning. Um, and this is the one that, like, you don't really have to treat the food poisoning. It kind of, on the cell serious, it will just kind of run its course and be done when they do have this. Other one was eye infection. So, all right. Going to Carinibacterium diphtheriae. So, again, it's a grandpa's rod. This one, though, it had the Chinese letters or maybe it looked like the letter V or the letter L, or it was palisading, meaning they lined up side by side by side. So it just, it has some unique features there on the gram stain plate. As far as, um, oh, by the way, the cells are catalase positive. I did not mention that. I just realized that because I was going to say it here. So, creating bacterium, because it's still a gram positive, you can catalase test it right away because that's always our rule. Anything gram positive, we can catalase test as the first step. And so, creating bacterium diphtheria is catalase positive. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Some other tests, we already mentioned it. It gets that brown halo on Tinsdale auger. And then the other thing, that you could run is a ure urea hydrolysis, and it will actually be negative. Most other crini bacteria will be positive for urea hydrolysis, whereas crini bacterium diphtheriae is negative. So those will kind of help separate this pathogen out from the rest. Again, in your lab, you probably heard the term diphtheroids, and that just means most crini bacterium species, again, are contaminants, they're off the skin. Um, we just call them diphtheroids. They're not really disease-causing. The only one that we really focus on as disease-causing is diphtheria, that species. Most people have the vaccination, so it shouldn't be a worry, but again, we have people that are not getting vaccinated for whatever their belief is. Um, so it could be something we still screen for. But the nice thing is we already know the disease, it's diphtheria. This is the one where they get the membrane across the back of the throat, so it can really impair and their breathing, which can be very dangerous. So it should be, though, in a DTAP vaccine otherwise. And then we already mentioned all the augers that go with it, Christine Tellurite, Lefflers, and Tinsdale, which I already said. So I think that is it there. Okay. Listeria monocytogenes, very much grandpa's rod, catalase positive. This one is the great motility, so modal. So if you did a wet mount, like just dropped like a nice little solution, it should have that tumbling motility. If you use a motility tube, like auger, it would be umbrella shaped. So it just depends on what style of motility test that you're running there. This one is camp positive and hip urate positive as well. What did we link for disease for listeria? Yes, very much again newborn or neonatal meningitis. Perfect. Um, so this was the one that came from pregnant women need to avoid certain deli meats, soft cheeses, because they could be at risk of listeriosis, which could cause impact to their baby. So um, this one looks very similar to strep A galactae on a plate. They're small beta hemolytic colonies. They both cause the same kind of disease, but they can be sep and they're both camp positive, hip urate positive, but they can be separated by the catalase test, the gram stain, and the motility pattern. Erysipelothrix rhuziopathiae, again, oops, grandpa's rod. This should be catalase negative. So that will help separate this grandpa's rod for some of these other ones. And let's see, as far as 
disease goes, it causes what we call an erysipelas, which is a skin ulcer type infection, and it mainly comes from animals. Um, so people that work a lot with animals, if they have any opening in their skin, they could have erysipelas or get in there and then cause that big old skin lesion. This is also, as far as the only other thing I want to mention here, it's the only grandpa's rod that produces H2S. We know gram-negative rods, yes, she already said it good. We know gram-negative rods that produce H2S like salmonella or proteus, but this is the only gram-positive rod that produces H2S. So that is a very unique feature here for it. That's really all you need to know there. It's not something that we see very commonly. Okay, Gardnerella vaginalis, it is a grandpa's rod. It is catalase negative. Again, that will help separate from the others. This is the one that we see with clue cells. We don't really grow this out on an auger plate or anything like that. Uh, we're mentioning it in this category because it is a grandpa's rod, but definitely we see it basically in urine or wet prep. So a vaginal like wet prep under the microscope as clue cells. So because it is causing BV, bacterial vaginosis. So clue cells, again, are those squamous epithelial cells filled with the bacteria. I can't spell while I type. So the way that you see the clue cells under the microscope, they'll obscure the outline of that squamous epithelial. They'll make it like normally squamous epithelial have a very defined shape wall to them. This will kind of skew the look of that outline. It will look very filled. It will be very refractile. Um, there, anybody ever get to see clue cells? Yep. So again, this is mainly coming from clinic world. When people, like women, will make appointments with the clinic if they think they have a yeast or vaginal infection, they do a wet prep, you look at it under a microscope, and you're always looking for yeast, flu cells for bacterial vaginosis, trichomonas. That's all stuff we screen for under on a wet prep as what might be causing their, you know, if they think they have a vaginal infection because they have discharge or, you know, pruritus or something like that. So, but we also can see it in urine. So it might show up in urine when you're looking at a urine too. So kind of fun. I actually am back in the day, and this shouldn't be done anymore, but I do work in a very small clinic lab that we still do what we call the WIF test. <laughs> I, I, I can't believe I still do this to this day. I would think that nothing should be smelled anymore in the lab. I think we've all learned, don't smell your plates. I know we talk about smells with auger and with bacteria, but you really shouldn't, but we still do the WIF test. So. For those of you that don't know, the WIF test is when you do a vaginal wet prep, you make your two slides on a wet prep. Usually you have a saline slide, and then you have the slide with KOH added to it to clear out everything so that you can see if yeast is present. When you add the KOH to your slide with the sample, you smell it, and that's what we call the WIF test. People that have, because the KOH will enhance the smell if it's there, and so anybody that has a really good bacterial vaginosis will have a very strong fish odor to it. <laughs> well, you would think that's what I told them. I said, you guys are all lucky you have masks on now because I have to take my mask off to do this. <laughs> like, but the thing is the KOH is supposed to enhance it even more. So maybe they didn't smell it while they were down there and the KOH helped enhance it. It, of course, is so up to interpretation. It is not a scientific test at all. It's, it's basically one of those, if you think it's there, it's there. If it's not, it's not. Like, you're like, whoop, yep, that's it. Or no, oh, it smells like nothing. So yeah, I still do that to this day, and it's kind of sad, but it's a very small little lab. <laughs> um, so, but don't smell things. But that was an old school test for bacterial vaginosis. So that's where the whole fishy tuna thing comes from too. If you ever think of that with bacterial vaginosis, it does have that odor. All right, let's go on. Fastidious bacteria. Okay, we will start with some Haemophilus here. What gram stain are Haemophilus? Yeah, 
Yes, they are gram egg rods or gram egg bacilli, whichever one you want to say. Both are the same. So I'm going to put that gram chain down for all four of them I have listed here. So all Haemophilus are gram egg rods. A lot of times people might call them gram egg cocobacilli. Um, they're very tiny. At any rate, these are so tiny. I've always nicknamed it junk in the background because I've heard that from a tech once. So I thought that was perfect because they're so little. They're easy to miss. Okay, so now we kind of switch gears. We're into some gram negative stuff. The very first test we run in gram negs is what? What do we run first? Yeah. Oxidase. So we would always run oxidase on all gram negative. So same for hemophilus. Now hemophilus, you gotta love it. It's not gonna be the exact same results on all four. It won't be across the board. Some of these are gonna be different. So hemophilus influenza is oxidase positive. Hemophilus para influenza is oxidase positive. Hemophilus ducreyi is oxidase negative. And hemophilus aprophilus is oxidase negative. So it does suck that they're not all the same results. The big bad boys that you should remember, of course, are hemophilus influenzae. Parent influenzae will show up. Um, so they are definitely oxidase positive. As far as other tests go, um, because it's fastidious, we can, and they will each vary from each other to separate, we can look for those X or V what they mean. So remember, X is hemin, V is NED, so it's these extra nutrients that they like. So each one will want different things. So hemophilus influenzae requires which one? Does it require X, V, or both for hemophilus influenzae? Good, it definitely requires both. So both will be positive there. So you can use different, you can use this. There's discs you can put on an auger plate with X disc and V disc. You can use a quad plate. So again, I think you maybe saw those at the micro lab here at college, the quad plates. So one area won't have anything in it, one will have both in it, one will have X only, one will have V only to see where it grew. So there's different ways to test that. Okay, what about para-influenzae? Which does that want? All right, so this one's a little harder. So it is V only. Yes, this one will only need V to help grow or to utilize. So it is just V positive. Hemophilus de Crayi, de Crayi is what? Yep, yeah, that's your X only. And then Hemophilus de Profilus. But it doesn't care. It doesn't want either. All right. So there is kind of helping differentiate between them. As far as diseases goes, Haemophilus influenzae, a little bit misconstruing because the name is influenza. We all know influenza is being caused by a virus. So Haemophilus influenzae does cause some major respiratory stuff. We just wouldn't necessarily call it influenza because that's a viral infection that we think about. So it's very much a cause of pneumonia. Um, so it's something we would commonly screen for in sputums. So a huge cause of pneumonia. It's also a cause of meningitis. What age group did it really affect with this? Yeah, kids, like six months to six years old, something like that. So it heavily, if it was gonna be present as meningitis, it was heavily in the younger kids, like the two to six year olds maybe. Um, but now they have that vaccine, it's called the HIB vaccination, it's influ Haemophilus influenzae type B. That was the specific one that was linked with meningitis. So now we can get HIB vaccine out there so it's really reduced that risk um, if you, of course, vaccinate. So there is, good, that was my next question. So there is a specific, it, so microbiology changes all the time. But it used to be called a subspecies. Now it's its own thing, I apparently. It changed on me. 
But I still throw it under this category. Yes, Haemophilus in aegypticus, or you can just call it Haemophilus influenzae subspecies aegypticus, but I think they do say now it's Haemophilus aegypticus on its own, linked with pink eye. Good. The other big thing that this um, Haemophilus influenzae causes was acute epiglottitis. It was one of, I think it's the number one cause of acute epiglottitis. Staph aureus is a big cause of that as well, but I think this was a number one cause of epiglottitis. So again, epiglottis is a little flapper that covers your airway. So if that gets inflamed, of course, obstructs your airway. Um, I already said it's very tiny. Let's see, only grows on chocolate auger. I did see somebody said that because it's very picky. It can do that satellite ptosis thing on Blood auger if staph aureus is present because staph, yep, staph aureus can provide it some of those extra nutrients and then it might satellite around those colonies. Uh, I think that is ill. I needed to mention there. I can't think of anything else. If I missed something, I'll come back. But all right, going on. Haemophilus para influenzae, we've already given test diseases, some respiratory infections. We're not going to list anything too specific. So that will be it there. Haemophilus ducreyi, of course, is an STD, call, and we call it chancroid. So again, this is the one that I remember it only needs X because it causes STD. So I think of XXX for sexual and it's sexual transmitted disease. So that's kind of how I always remember this is the one that only needs X. Uh, nothing else there. And then Haemophilus aprophilus is the one that is causing endocarditis because it is part of that HASIC group of bacteria. I know that they changed the first letter there of that HASIC group. It used to be Haemophilus aprophilus. Now I think it's Haemophilus from blah, 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 blah something else. Um, again, they like to change things. So, but it's part of that group that's known as causing slowly progressive bacterial endocarditis. So that's the big thing that we linked there. Okay, going on, Bordetella pertussis is a gram-negative rod. And so this is, again, we have to do oxidase right away because it is a gram-negative. This is oxidase positive. Um, another test result, I don't think we really covered this in our lecture, it is non-modal. Basically, we are looking at using those special augers. We can use to grow this one out where they can go. We've already mentioned Reagan Low was another one. And we are doing a nasopharyngeal type collection swab. Um, I think most places use a molecular technique to look for this. And again, this is part of that DTAP vaccine, so it should hopefully be covered under that. But if it's for, for the disease, it is looking cough or what we call pertussis. Okay. Pastorella multiceta is another gram-negative rod. Also oxidase positive in this. No, I don't want to mention that. I'm going to leave it alone as far as testing goes. What do we think of for disease with this one before I lift it? Yeah. Very much animal zoonotic is a nice way to say it. Animal bite, scratches. Any time that I read a case study that talks about an animal scratch or animal bite, I have a few bacteria in mind, and pastorella is always the, one of the very first ones I'm thinking about. That is so heavily linked. I don't really hear about pastorella outside of the zoonotic infection much. So I'm always thinking of this is one of the big ones I think of right away for animal stuff. I think of a few others. Um, but yeah, that's the biggest thing there. And I don't think I needed you to know much else on that. There is, of course, a lot of other testing results that go along with these, but you can't remember everything. But if you ever get those Valerie Polanski cards, they will have some other test results on there with them. So that's helpful. Okay, let's keep going on our prestigious organisms. We're gonna do some Neisseria here. Gram stain of Neisseria. Good. It is a gram-negative diplococci. 
Um, this is the one that's supposed to be kidney bean shaped, if you can ever see it that closely, <laughs> but it's gram negative diplococci. All right, so it is still gram negative. We do want to oxidase test it because we oxidase test all gram negs first. So, Neisseria is very much oxidase positive. And then the other big thing that we've learned with Neisserias is what do we use to help separate between the Neisserias? Very good, yes, carbohydrate or sugar fermenting. Good. So we have learned that each one will require different things. So Neisseria gonorrhea will ferment what sugars or sugar? Very much glucose positive only. So yes, I've always said the G's go together, gonorrhea and glucose there. Perfect. For Neisseria meningitidis, which ones will that do? Good, it now goes with both. Yep, so out to the M for multiple meningitis. Good. And then I know we talked about Neisseria lactamica in class that fermented glucose molecules and lactose. Um, it's not a big disease causer, so I just left it off this slide. So, okay. The beautiful thing about Neisseria is their name for what they cause, or vice versa. It's the disease is named for the bacteria. So, Neisseria gonorrhea causes gonorrhea. Neisseria meningitis is a huge cause of meningitis. So, which age group though goes with the meningitis or Neisseria meningitis? What is it mainly age group here? Not young children, that's the teens, good. This is the one like if you sometimes hear those horror stories, they go to dorms and they're in close quarters and somebody might end up, you know, getting meningitis. So typically that, again, there is a vaccine now for this, thankfully, so they should get a vaccine at a certain age um, to help prevent that. And I think it's a, what they call meningococcal vaccine, so, because it's meningitis and it is a coxy. Okay. Did I need to say anything else here? Again, we already talked about the augers, Thayer Martin, Martin Lewis, and NYC augers. For the, to screen for Neisseria's. You don't need to mention that. I think we're good on that. All right, Maraxella cateralis is a gram neg diplococci. The other species of Maraxella are gram neg rods. So there are other species of Maraxella that are gram neg rods, but Maraxella cateralis is a gram neg diplococci. So we always group it together here. It is oxidase positive. If you were to sugar test it, it does not ferment any of the sugars. So that would be negative across the board. Um, there is a test called the DNA test that it would be positive for. Uh, there is a cateralis disc that you can use that it would be positive for. But as far as diseases goes, lots of upper respiratory infections. So otitis media, like ear infections, things like that, sinusitis. So lots of upper respiratory infections. And then this is the one that's kind of fun that's said to be like a hockey puck because when you try to pick it up off the chocolate plate, it kind of slides across. All right, going into Francisella to Laurentis, this is a gram negative rod. It is oxidase negative. This again, we'll oxidase test all of it. If you were to urease test it, it would be negative. I mentioned that now because you're going to see it helps separate from something else here in a minute. As far as disease goes, this is called tutheremia, heavily found with different animals, especially rabbits, rodents, that kind of thing will all carry Francisella. It has also been turned into a bioterrorism weapon because you need very little of it to cause an infection. So that's why it's such a great bioterrorism weapon is you don't need a lot of it to do its damage. Brucella is gram negrod, oxidase positive, urease positive. So you can see how those test results will separate from Francisella. Causes brucellosis, which is again linked with animals, but each one 
was linked with certain animals, depending on the strain. So Bacillus, Bacillus, Brucella sui was pig, Brucella melitensis was goats or sheep, Brucella canis is dogs, and Brucella abortus is cows. So it just depended on the animal. And again, this is another good bioterrorism weapon one. So you should be under a category hood three with Rhamcocella and Brucella and Legionella. Um, so you should not be working. Most hospital labs have just a level two. You need a level three hood if you think you have one of these. Legionella, again, is going to be a gram negative rod. Right? Yeah. I don't know what's wrong with my brain this morning. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, today's positive. This is the one that we use BCYE agar for. You can, like um, somebody I mentioned earlier, use BCYE agar for Francisella as well. Of course, causes Legionnaire's disease. That is, we had a case study on that. That is the one that's coming from like air conditioning, water type environment. It loves to thrive in. It was named because it was first discovered at causing a bunch of infections from people in an American Legion back in like 76 or something in like Pennsylvania. So they named it Legionnaires for that American Legion setting where it was first discovered. There is a, another disease that it can cause called Pontiac fever, which is, um, I know that CDC has a page on that as well. So, okay, I think that's it there. Okay, yep, I had to think about something there. All right, so this is that HASIC. Um, I mentioned this earlier with the Haemophilus aprophilus, but there is a group of organisms, again, they all are categorized under here because they cause one, they cause slowly progressive endocarditis, and then they're also all gramnate rods, capnophilic, meaning they love CO2, fastidious, typically slower growers, and they can all be normal flora of the oral cavity. So they all share these same features, and so that's why they've grouped in together under this HASIC. So again, here is the current names of the last I knew of what they call for HASIC group. So Haemophilus, oh, now they call it Paraprophilus. I still say Aprophilus. I can't even say the word now. A was a different name. Now it's Aggregatobacter actinomycetomycomatans. What a name. My gosh. Cardiobacteria, Iconella corridans, and Kingella are all part of this group. I think before, um, one mention, because I don't think I have a separate slide on this now that I think about it. If I do, I apologize, I'll repeat it again. But a mention on Iconella cordons, this is the one that can also be seen with clenched fist wounds because, well, all these can be held in the oral cavity as normal flora. So Iconella was always linked heavily with like upon fighting and somebody would get punched in the mouth. That person that punched them could get, you know, they get abrasions across their fists from, and they could get this iconella into those abrasions from that person's, you know, normal oral flora. So, yep, very much does known to be smell like bleach and it pits the auger when it grows. So, again, I always think accordance as corrosive. I know bleach is corrosive, so that's kind of how I always remember that. Okay, good. All right, now we'll move on to. The rest of our huge gram neg rods, mainly they come in the Antibacteriaceae group. These you see every day in the micro world. Um, so again, what test differentiates gram negative rods? And I think we've already answered that in the form of it is oxidase. So these Antibacteriaceae bacteria are all put together because they're all oxidase negative. That's why we do that oxidase test first. Because if it's oxidase negative, we're already thinking about maybe it's one of these guys because they're so popular. They're all gram negative rods. Most of them are catalase positive. They're all glucose fermenters. And again, that's glucose, not lactose. That's totally different. They're all glucose fermenters, and most of them reduce nitrates to nitrites. So they all share these five characteristics to be considered an enterobacteriaceae. Um, the biggest, most popular one, of course, is going to be E. coli out of this group. And we see E. coli, again, every day in the lab. Um, 
So there are many different strains of E. coli. We have enterotoxigenic E. coli, which is traveler's diarrhea. That's that one that was nicknamed like Montezuma's Revenge. So if you were to like drink the water in Mexico or something like that. Enteroinvasive E. coli causes dysentery. Enterohemorrhagic E. coli is your E. coli 0157. Um, lots of, that has that really big shiga toxin attached to it. So huge disease causer. It can result in causing hot hemolytic uremic syndrome, especially in children coming from like foods, different foods that might be contaminated. You always hear of foods being recalled for having salmonella or shigella or E. coli 157. Enteropathogenic E. coli was more linked with infants. So again, lots of different strains. There's so many E. coli. On the whole, they tend to be beta hemolytic with gray colonies. Now, there are non hemolytic strains of E. coli very much. So again, that's not always picture perfect. A lot of them are beta hemolytic, but there are definitely non hemolytic E. coli as well. They are lactose fermenters for the most part on McConkie agar. So they will turn that purpley colony color on McConkie. If you were to use EMB, they have a very unique green metallic sheen on the EMB agar. So as far as diseases go with E. coli, so many things. UTIs are heavily seen in stool. Like we're looking for E. coli 0157 for stool, like for um, food poisoning kind of thing. So in a stool culture. Now remember, E. coli is naturally housed in your intestinal tract as normal flora. So all of us should have normal E. coli when you were to grow it out on a plate. But as far as food poisoning and linked to causing infection, that's E. coli 0157 for the most part, or maybe enteroinvasive dysentery or the tra travelers. But otherwise, most other strains of E. coli are normal healthy flora in our intestinal tract. So you kind of have to screen for certain strains out of that. It gets a little trickier. But otherwise, wound infections, um, sepsis is a big one. Like there's so many things it does go with. It's a big pathogen. Okay, Shigella, there are four main groups of Shigella. Shigella dysenteriae is group A. You don't have to remember the group names on these. I wouldn't bother. Just know Shigella dysenteriae causes a lot of epidemics, Shigella flexneri, Shigella boidei, Shigella sconei. So again, a lot of food poisoning, diarrhea stuff here basically linked with Shigella. So on HE agar, we already mentioned they're blue-green colonies. On XLD, they are clear. And then they are non lactose fermenters on the conchiagra, so they will be a clear color. Shigella does have a capsule, so a lot of times if they're going to serotype and really break down what it is, they have to heat it up to serotype it. Salmonella, again, a lot of diarrhea. <laughs> this will enter back to your ACA is a lot of diarrhea. So gastroenteritis and diarrhea linked to salmonella, typhimurium, and salmonella enteritis. I can't say that word, enteritis. Other salmonellas, we have salmonella typhi, which has been linked to typhoid fever. Again, same color colonies as Shigella, blue-green on HE, clear on XLB, non lactose fermenter on McConkey, but again, salmonella is an H2S producer. And we're going to go through some test results here in a little bit, so hang on to that. We'll get to some testing results for these. Yersinia, um, we have Yersinia pestis, which is the cause of the plague. We do still see that to this day because it's found especially in prairie dogs. Um, so if you handle any animal that might have it, you could still end up with getting a Yersinia pestis infection. I know when we think of the plague, we think of like, it, you know, you hear the historical facts of it, like they used to put people that were infected dead bodies with and they throw it in their enemy's camp so that they would get infected with the plague as well. You know, you think of those kind of things, but it is still a present infection that can occur. Yersinia enterocolitica causes enterocolitis. That's that thin agar bullseye shaped colony. Proteus is a big one. I'm sure you guys saw Proteus almost every day. <laughs> like huge cause of UTIs, especially. We all know it has that really unique Warming morphology on a plate. Two biggest proteases would be Proteus mirabilis versus Proteus vulgaris. They can be separated by their indole results. Proteus mirabilis, again, is indole negative. Proteus vulgaris is indole positive. 
Tuscella and Arabacter are both other species we see a lot in the lab. Um, very mucusy colonies. They look like snot on a plate. Clubsdale and pneumonia has been linked a lot with pneumonia. Um, otherwise, you see these a lot with UTIs as well. The Raytheum or Sessin as a nosocomial type UTI situation. This one sometimes can be a late lactose fermenter, so it can almost have like a reddish hue on the conchi plate instead of the purple. Not always, but it's just one of its characteristics. All right, and then there's so many others that are in this category. There's Morganella, Providencia are in this category. Um, Edward Ciela is in this category. So there's a lot of other ones I didn't mention, but I mentioned the main ones that you're gonna see and look for and screen for. Okay, now let's talk about testing. So once we know that these are gram neg rods, oxidase negative, which all of them were, we have to figure out, okay, which one is it? So we can use a lot of other tests to help figure out which bacteria it might be. Invic was common, which is indole, methyl red, bone cross and citrate. So that's your Invic panel. And then urea is commonly used. You can look for motility pattern as well. As you guys probably all saw in your micro rotation, a lot of times we're putting these on those big panel plates and letting an analyzer read all the test reactions and then it tells you what you have, which is beautiful. I love it. But for the sake of boards and testing, you have to know some of these results. All right, so indole, as soon as we know we have a gram neg rod, oxidase negative, we can indole test it. And you can either do the spot indole test with a little dropper and a bacteria colony in it, and it will turn um, a blue color on the spot usually, or if you're using a tubed media, and it, like an MIO tube, there's what we call an MIO tube motility indole ornithine, um, or another tubed media, it might have a red ring that it will form at the top when it's positive. It just depends on what indole form of testing you're doing. But indole is basically meaning if you are positive for that, that your bacteria can split the amino acid tryptophan into indole. So on like a test question, if you were to ever see the word tryptophan, you should be thinking about indole. That's I know that there's some question in your board study guide book that has that in there, um, that it asks about tryptophan. It's basically asking about indole. So kind of link that with it in the microbiology world. The ones that are very much indole positive, thank God there's only really three that you have to memorize here. E. coli, huge, huge characteristic for E. coli to be indole positive. That one you should definitely remember. Proteus vulgaris and then Klebsiella oxytoca. That will help separate from the other big Klebsiella, which is Klebsiella pneumoniae. That one is negative for indole. So indole can help separate between Klebsiella oxytoca versus Klebsiella pneumoniae, because those are two of the bigger ones for Klebsiella. So those three are indole positive. Methyl red, now methyl red, I'm kind of going more in depth on these than I did in class originally, just because I want you to have this background for boards. Methyl red basically means that if a bacteria can do this, it can perform mixed acid fermenting when you're given glucose. So it can basically ferment acetic, lactic, and oh, I can't say the word, succinic acids in large amounts. It can form these acids in large amounts when they have glucose. So the bacteria that can do this are E. coli, Proteus vulgaris, Citrobacter frondii, Shigella flexneri, and Salmonella typhi. All others will be negative, which is a yellow color. So if it's positive, it'll be red, just like the name, methyl red, um, if they can do this. So those are the bacteria that are known to be methyl red positive. Now, VP, Vogue-Proskauer, is if your bacteria can do this, you can produce what we call acetoin when you're given glucose. So the nice thing is, if a bacteria does methyl red positive, making all these acids when given glucose, they cannot do Vogue-Proskauer. If they can do Vogue-Proskauer, they cannot do methyl red. They have to be one or the other, because when they're given glucose, they're looking at what can they make in the end. So again, the methyl red bacteria can make all these acids. The Vogue-Proskauer bacteria, when given glucose, will make acetoin. So it's one or the other, it's not both. So for Vogue-Proskauer, the positive again will be a red color. The ones that can do Vogue-Proskauer positive are Klebsiella's, so the Klebsiella pneumonia and Oxitoca, Enterobacter, and Seracea marcescens. All others will be negative. So keep that in mind, one versus the other. Can't be both on those. 
And then citrate will basically saying that the bacteria will use citrate as a carbon or energy source. Positive will be a blue color, negative will be a green color. It's sometimes really hard to tell the blue from the green in that citrate tube. They look so similar sometimes, but positive is a blue color. Um, so lots of citrate positive bacteria here. The Klebsiella's, um, that's a huge feature for Klebsiella. It's also a big feature for Proteus to be citrate positive. Citrobacter, that should one should be easy. It has citro right in the name of it. Enterobacter, a couple of salmonels, not all of them, and Cerecia are all citrate positive. Flashcards are a great thing to hear on these, by the way. I know, it's a lot of memorization. Or if you can come up with saying, that might help too. Okay, urea is saying that the bacteria will have the urease enzyme, which can split urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide. It will be extremely positive, bright pink color. Proteus are hugely urease positive, and so are the Klebsiella's. Um, there is another bacteria that is not in this category that we talk about later with urea, but we're gonna leave that alone because it's not as part of this category of Enterobacteriaceae. But the ones out of the Enterobacteriaceae group that are very much known to be urease positive are Proteus and Klebsiella's. Motility, pretty much almost all Enterobacteriaceae group are modal. They have flagella, they can move around. There are three that are commonly non-modal. Shigella, it's a huge feature of Shigella to be non-modal. Klebsiella, to a point, is non-modal, and Yersinia, or no, I should say Klebsiella is non-modal. Yersinia is non-modal at certain temperatures. That one gets a little funky, but there, most others can move, will have motility. All right, and then the old school testing of TSI, LIA, again, these aren't really done in the labs anymore because we have these nice instrumentation, but for boards, you still kind of have to be familiar with some TSI, LIA results. TSI is triple sugar iron auger, so it's containing lactose, sucrose, and glucose, that's why it's triple sugar. So if an organism can ferment any of those sugars, it will turn the auger yellow or it'll be kind of acidic, which we call A the letter A, acidic for yellow color. If they will only ferment glucose, then it's just a alkaline purple result, so K. Um, remember, these are looking at the Enterobacteriaceae bacteria. All Enterobacteriaceae ferment glucose. So all of them will have, usually can ferment glucose. So most of the time they should have that yellow bottom because they can ferment the glucose. If they can ferment any of the others, then the whole thing will turn yellow. Otherwise, only the top, the top will remain purple if they can only ferment glucose. So again, if it's only a fermenter of glucose, it's K over A. Otherwise, if it can ferment any of the other sugars, then the whole tube will turn yellow and be A over A. So here's what you have for that E. coli, tends to be a couple different things depending on the strain of it, because again, the strains of E. coli just will have a few different test results. Um, so A over A, you see E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Yersinia. A over A with H2S production, Proteus vulgaris. K over A, E. coli, or Shigella. Because again, Shigella and Salmonella are non-fermenters, so they should never be in the A or A category, if you think about it. Shigella and Salmonella, we always know as they're non-fermenters, really, they are non-lactose fermenters. So they can't be in the A over A category because they can only really ferment glucose. So they should always be in the K over A. Salmonella produces H2S, whereas Shigella does not. So hopefully that helps a little bit there. Um, all right, and then Proteus morabilis can be in the K over A with H2S. So these are tricky, I agree. Um, you just have to remember that if they ferment glucose only, they'll have a K over A reaction. If they can ferment any of the other sugars, they'll have an A over A, the whole tube will be yellow. And then there was LIA results as well. I'm not gonna get into those. If you can't remember the TSI LIA results, that's fine. There's a lot of other microbiology questions that you can do, so um, you should be okay. All right, some other gram-nave rods that are not part of that Enterobacteriaceae group. So Campylobacter, we definitely screen for this on a regular basis, especially with stool cultures. Um, so they are gram-nave rods. They're said to look like seagull wings. 
because they have a slight curve to them. They are oxidase positive. So that will separate Campylobacter out from the rest of the Enterobacteriaceae. Yeah, that's so nice of you to offer that flow chart. So if anybody wants that, that's awesome. So Campylobacter are also non fermenters Typically, we link, okay, again, Campylobacter jejuni is the big one. We're always looking for it with stool cultures because it does cause food poisoning. It is, in fact, the, probably the most common cause of food poisoning um, or bacterial diarrhea, if you will, especially from chicken. That's a huge one with chicken, with raw chicken. So Campylobacter jejuni is the one that's really unique in that it has to grow at a 42 degree temperature environment. So if you are working on stool cultures in your micro department, they, you most likely will have another incubator set at 42 degrees to help screen for that Campylobacter jejuni. Of course, molecular has come into play. A lot of labs won't even do stool culture work up now. They will put it on a molecular instrument and let that read it, which is amazing that that exists. But if you are still working on stool cultures the old-fashioned way on auger plates, you probably have a 42 degree Celsius incubator. Um, another test result for Campylobacter jejuni, besides being oxidase positive, needing 42 degrees, it's also hip urate positive. Campylobacter coli is linked with gastroenteritis, Campylobacter betis, Campylobacter concisus curvus, there's some others there, but Campylobacter jejuni is the big one out of the bunch. Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori, gram negrod, oxidase positive, Hugely urease positive. It's such a big feature of it to be urea positive. This is the one, of course, that we screen if we think somebody might have an ulcer or gastritis. Um, we don't really grow this out. So we're looking at it a few different ways. You can do the breath test where they breathe into a bag, seal it, they drink a solution. 15 minutes later, they breathe into another bag. You can do it versus a biopsy. So you can put the little biopsy sample into urea auger, and if it turns pink, it was H. pylori. Um, you can also test it through blood. So we're not growing those, we're testing it some other way. Vibrio, uh, lots of Vibrio species, but the main one we always think about is Vibrio cholera. All Vibrio type is coming from a water type environment. They all are known to cause gastrointestinal infection. So Vibrio cholera is our big one causing cholera. That's especially seen in more underdeveloped countries. And that is the one that has like the rice water stools. It's very, very watery, watery diarrhea with little flux of mucus in it. So they nicknamed it rice water stools. Vibrio parahemolyticus is gastroenteritis. Vibrio vulnificus is a very extreme septicemia. It's quick. If somebody were to get Vibrio vulnificus as a sept infection, it's very fatal. It goes very fast for that person. And Vibrio algonolyticus, we don't worry about it. It doesn't do much. So all of Vibrio are gram negros, oxidase positive, and they have a positive string test, which will separate them from some other organisms here. They do like to grow again on a TCBS auger. If it's Vibrio cholera, it'll be yellow colonies. If it is a different Vibrio, like Parahemolyticus or Vulnificus, they will be green colonies. So that will help separate between the Vibrios. And we really only screen for Vibrio cholera if we know somebody has been to a country that maybe would have more of this present. Um, it is not something we screen for normally in the United States for diarrhea, um, because if they stayed in the area, they most likely don't have this. Aramonis, another gram negrod, oxy positive, also coming for water environments. Um, so in this case, it's string test negative, so that'll separate it from the Vibrio species. And then Plesiomon, the same thing, is string test negative coming from water, um, so that will also separate it. The only species is Plesiomonas shigalloides, and again, causing gastroenteritis stuff. Okay, so some other gram rods that are non-fermenters. I forget that this is a long PowerPoint. We're getting there, guys, I promise. Pseudomonas, oh, I love pseudomonas. It's so fun when you see it. I wish everything was this pretty. Um, this is a big one that we see quite commonly in the lab, especially like UTI stuff. But gram rod, they are non-fermenter again. That's why they're in a separate category. Oxidase positive, that's a huge feature of it. 
Now, student bonus has the ability to produce pigments. That's why student bonus original is so, so pretty. They can produce a bioveridin pigment, which is a yellow green pigment. All student bonus species can do that. And then student bonus original, so it can also make a pyrocyanin pigment, which is blue green. This is giving it that nice blue green sheen look that it has. It's said to have a grape odor, or some people think it smells like tortilla chips, whatever you think. Again, don't be smelling stuff. <laughs> okay, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the biggest pathogen out of the Pseudomonas group. Um, lots of UTIs, that's where I've mainly seen it at with infections in the micro world um, or sepsis, bacteremia, but it is also a huge cause of respiratory tract infections, especially if it's a cystic fibrosis patient. They're very prone to that. The other thing is we have otitis externa swimmer's ear because Pseudomonas loves itself a warm hot tub, just like we do, that can happen. Pseudotrophomonas multifilia is a non fermentogram nigra, but this one is oxidase negative. Uh, typically, we're linking this with nosocomial hospital environment type infections. Acinetobacter, it's a tough one for me. Gravity rod, oxidase negative, non fermenter, again, also nosocomial infection. Pretty much nothing else we see it with. Burkholderia sepacea is again gravity rod, oxidase positive, non fermenter. Um, this is also associated with cystic fibrosis patients causing respiratory infections. Other Burkholderia, we have Burkholderia mallei, which is a gram negra causing glander disease. It's pretty much isolated in animals only, very rare in humans, unless it's a bioterrorism weapon. And then Burkholderia pseudo mallei causes malleidosis, which is a respiratory infection. And I wouldn't get too much into depth in these. Okay, going into mycobacteria world. So we have four classes to our mycobacteria and we're separating them depending on if they produce pigment or not and how fast they can grow. Almost all mycobacteria are very slow grower. They're gonna take longer than seven days to grow out on an auger plate and they like to grow in the dark at certain environmental temperature and stuff. So photochromogens are ones that can produce pigment following exposure to light, so photo for light. Photochromogen, will produce pigment whether it's in the dark or in light. Non-photochromogens are non-pigmented and then rapid growers will grow in less than seven days. Now, there is a ton of mycobacteria, you had a whole study guide on it, but I'm just gonna whittle it down to the big main featured ones. So of course you have your ones that can cause tuberculosis. So the main one would be mycobacterium tuberculosis. The other two that have been known to cause tuberculosis are Mycobacterium bovis and Africana. They are all slow growers, non-pigmented colonies, so they would all fit in the non-photochromogen group here. And again, we use that Manto or Quantiferon test for healthcare workers to screen to see if they've had it or been exposed, and then you can do a chest x-ray as well. Other mycobacteria um, that are not tuberculosis typically found everywhere in the environment. Um, not typically transmitted person to person like tuberculosis is. Tuberculosis, those people, if they're in the hospital, have to be in that reverse isolation room where the airflow has to go out a certain way through filters um, because it is contagious and it hangs in the air, whereas other mycobacteria don't usually have that going on. So mycobacterium leprae is leprosy, otherwise known as Hansen's disease. So it's a chronic disease of skin, mucous membranes, nerve tissue. Usually we're just using PCR to look for this. And then there was, the only, oh, I didn't have a sign, I tied it. The other group would be the mycobacterium avium group, which I've been linked with, especially with causing infections in people with AIDS as a complication, so. Otherwise, I think there's a lot of mycobacterium. If you can't remember them all, just try to remember the rest of the stuff. <laughs> you can only fit so much in your brain. You gotta figure out what you're gonna fit in there. All right, anaerobes. Let's start with our clostridium species of anaerobes. These are all gram-positive rods. They all form spores. So there are four main species of anaerobes that we have that we'll go through. But again, they're all gram-positive rods, all forming spores. 
We could use CCF A agar again for Clostridium difficile, and again, there'll be yellow colonies on there if they grow. But here are your four Clostridium. So Clostridium botulinum is our Botox one, but also known to cause severe food poisoning. Clostridium tetani is your tetanus or lockjaw. Again, you should have a vaccination to get every 10 years to prevent this. Clostridium perfringens is the one that can cause gas green, gangrene along with the food poisoning. That would be a double zone of beta hemolysis. That's a unique feature of it when it grows on an auger plate. And then again, C. diff is your severe diarrhea, usually following a course of antibiotics. If they've been on a lot of antibiotics, that's when it tends to cause issues for the patient. This is one that we do have to isolate people in the hospital or in like nursing homes that they do have C. diff they're known to, so to help prevent the spread to others. Again, yellow colonies on CCFA agar, and we're typically diagnosing C. diff through like a PCR technique or a kit versus growing it on a plate. Bacteroides fragilis are gram, so all bacteroides are gram neg rods. Um, again, I had said this earlier, they're the most common anaerobic infection if you just ignore the C. diff world. Um, if you truly have an infection, infection of anaerobe, it's usually bacteroides. Um, typically, the infections occur below the diaphragm, but it can occur throughout the body. Very gross, smelly, likes to grow with bile, so it'll grow on BBE agar. And then it is resistant to those three different antibiotic discs that you can put on there, canamycin, vancomycin, colstin. So that's kind of a unique feature for bacteria to be resistant to all of them. Okay. There we go. So use a bacterium nucleatum, gram neg rod, anaerobe. This is the one that had the tapered or pointed ends, which is very unique. Typically causes infections above the diaphragm, sensitive to canamycin. Prevotella and Porphyromonas are both gram rods. These are the ones that fluoresce a brick red color. And again, the infections tend to be above the diaphragm. Propiani bacterium acnes is a gram positive rod. The word acnes tells you it's kind of associated with inflammatory acne type infection. But it's also a common contaminant of blood cultures because it's kind of coming off the skin. So it can be known as a contaminant in blood cultures. Okay, moving on into some other unique organisms. Oh, we only have three slides left. <laughs> Mycoplasma, urea plasma, they are separate out because they have no cell walls. You cannot gram stain them. Again, we could use that acridine orange um, fluorescent dye technique to bind to the nucleic acids to tell us they're there. They're very small. You pretty much can't really grow them out normally. Um, the one that we're most worried about out of them that we see more often would be mycoplasma pneumoniae, which is your walking pneumonia. There is like a kit test for this. Um, so to tell, a lot of labs might have that. And then urea plasma, urea lyticum, and mycoplasma hominis have been more associated with the genital urinary tract infections. Some other things, we have some intracellular organisms, so of course chlamydia, which is your number one STD that's out there. We diagnose this through PCR molecular technique along with gonorrhea. Usually when people get screened, it's a gonorrhea chlamydia swab screen on a molecular technique, or it's in a urine sample. They love a dirty catch urine. They can use that too in PCR. So causing what we call pelvic inflammatory disease, PID, can also cause conjunctivitis. Too, but yeah, mainly it's our biggest screening for STD. Chlamydophila cytokai definitely comes from bird droppings. This causes a pneumonia. Rickettsia is coming from ticks, causing Rocky Mountain spot fever. Orensia, I love this word, Sukukumushi. I don't care. I may say it wrong, but I love it. Is coming from chiggers, like if you think about a lake that has chiggers in it. Ehrlichia is definitely something we screen for more in hematology because it can be seen as an inclusion in the neutrophils coming from ticks and then Coxiella has a few different sources of animals, but it causes Q fever. And spirochetes, syphilis would be the big one here. Um, we use other testing. We're not like growing out spirochetes. We use a lot of other testing here to look for these. Um, so treponema pallid on this, your syphilis, and we can screen with RPR VDRL. If that is positive, it will reflect 
to like a fluorescent technique where you look for it under the microscope using a fluorescent. Like I said, fluorescent technique, that's what FTA means. Uh, Borrelia, there's two different ones. The Verdurfri is Lyme disease. We usually are using blood, looking for antibodies here if they have Lyme disease. Borrelia brucarensis is relapsing fever. Again, Lyme disease, especially coming from ticks. That's been really prevalent lately, especially, like I know a lot of animals get it too, dogs, horses. And then Leptospira was the one that can be gotten like from water, that's when contaminated out of urine of certain animals that have had it. Okay. So, oh, my goodness, we're finally done with that PowerPoint. Again, I will send you the blank version of this PowerPoint along with the filled in version of this PowerPoint. Oh my gosh, it's hard to sit all day like this. <laughs> okay, so let's keep moving. Again, at about 10.28 ish, we're going to take a pause for me to do a quick half hour meeting. Hopefully, be. And you probably want a break anyway at that point. We do have a few things to finish out. One before we move, uh, no, I am gonna finish. We have pictures yet to go through you guys. We still have to talk about fungi and parasites. So let's, let's do our parasites. Usually fungi is a little bit more fun for people or easier to remember maybe. Okay, and there, this isn't the exact same PowerPoint. It's very similar to what you have from class, but I think I added to it or rearranged some things. So it's gonna look very similar though. Um, but we gotta remember these dang buggers. And as we look at the picture, I'll try to add any extra notes on about them that you should know. Again, I will send you this PowerPoint along with the answer key to it as well. So what do you guys think this little guy is? Yeah. Spelling, do your best on this. I know it's not easy to spell or any part of the word that you can put out. Yes, it is diantamoeba fragilis, which is technically a flagellate. It is not an amoeba like the name suggests. It looks like an amoeba when you look at it here, but it is under the flagellate category, so it should move by flagella. The key with diantamoeba is that it's got these little four or so chrome, like karyo, I just forgot the words to say, little dots in them in the nucleus, it kind of helps it. Okay, this one. This one's tougher for people. It's actually to be one of two things. Yep, now you guys are getting it. Um, so you can call it fasciolopsis busky or fasciola hepatica. They look identical. So it could be either one. Um, they do look identical. Look at these little guys. Yes. Leash mania. Um, so leash mania commonly seen with inside macrophages. Um, so if you were to have like a skin sample or something like that. So leash mania. Yeah, definitely plasmonium. It is malaria. Um, in this case, it is plasmonium falciparum, but the ring stage looks almost identical in all plasmoniums. The falciparum is the one that can have the two dots. Most ring stages just have one. It is not E. coli, good guess. It is entamoeba histolytica. Yeah, there you guys are starting to write things. So it is an amoeba and it's histolytica. So entamoeba histolytica is your pathogen out of the amoeba. The rest of them don't tend to cause a lot of problems. So this one is the one that's known to cause liver abscesses and amoebic dysentery, so basically a lot of diarrhea. Um, the key with entamoeba histolytica is it can ingest different things, and one of the things it can ingest is red blood cells, which you can see on the inside of it here, so that's a key feature. All the other amoebas do not do that. They cannot ingest red cells like this, so that kind of helps separate it a bit.
Yeah, it is Babesia. The key is the Maltese cross or tetrad form here coming from ticks. Good. Otherwise, it has a ring stage, that, which looks very similar to Plasmodium. Oh, why do I always forget this one? I think I know which one I was putting here. I might have to look just to make sure. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. I couldn't remember if it was Lolo or Wicaria I threw here. I think I threw in, I think this is Wicaria Bancrofty. They look very similar. Lolo and Wicaria look similar. I gotta look at my answer key because I want to guide you wrong. Thank God I'm going to send you an answer key. It is Wicaria. <laughs> I know, they look very similar. So there is a slide I have toward the end of this PowerPoint that I added on that will show you the difference between Wicaria Bancrofty versus Loa Loa. Um, the key is going to be toward the end of the worm, whether it has terminal nuclei that go all the way to the end or if it has space. Let's see, actually, I might go to it right now since we're talking about it. Right here. So this is hard to see. I know here, I'm gonna try to zoom it in for you guys. So you can see Wicaria bancrofti is the top one. And so it's sheets and nuclei do not extend to the tip of the tail. Brugia malayi, which is sheets, but it does have terminal nuclei separated. And loa loa is sheets and they extend all the way to the tail in general. So supposedly that will help separate between them, but you'd have to really be able to zoom in there and see that clearly, which is hard to do. <laughs> so at least you knew it was in this family region and just do the best you can. Um, if you were to get a, here's the deal for boards. You're gonna get luck of the draw on, on parasites and mycology. They're gonna ask you maybe a couple questions each. There's so much to know. You should be fine. You have multiple choice. Just rule out and rule in as best as you can. And it'll be just a matter of what you get. You might get four mycology, one parasite question. You might get three parasite, three mycology. It's just it's random, but it's gonna be very little compared to the rest of what they're gonna ask you out of microbiology. Now, if you were to go into MLS, it's gonna be a bit more prevalent on those questions, but yes, you will have some, um, and it's just gonna be luck of the draw, unfortunately, out of all the content that they can give you on it. So that's why we just focus as much as we can on the main stuff. So this is with Carrie Bancrofty on that slide. I have another one that I'll have to look up which one I wanted it to be. Um, so, what does Wuchery Van Crofty cause? Do you guys remember when you get that parasitic infection? Yes, elephantiasis. So, this is the one that when it does dig in and come into them, it loves to go to the lymph nodes, and you have lymph nodes throughout your body and causes extreme inflammation. Um, so, that's what we call elephantiasis. So, it can be in somebody's legs that will extremely swell up in like your arm, neck, whatever, wherever you have lymph nodes, it can go and settle. All right, so this is a new picture I added since class, but it is a picture I want you to know for boards, or I want you to know this organism for boards. Yeah, we did discuss it. Hopefully you guys have seen this on your media lab. I know when past students knew it from media lab CE. So we added it in to get your ramps up for boards. Now, I don't have anything on the final exam on Friday on this because it's kind of newer, but I want you to know it for boards. It is Ascaris lumbricoides, which is our round worm. Ascaris is very much known to have this, what we call mammillated shell, this bumpy, bumpy looking shell here. That is key feature of it. That is your round worm. All right, I gotta look up. I'm gonna just tell you what this one is. I think this one's Loa Loa, yes. Okay, good. Because it has nuclei extending all the way to the end of that tail there, if you can kind of see that. <laughs> so that is Loa Loa. Loa Loa, again, is known as to be the African eye worm. All right, how about this guy? Yes, I just love him so much. Not to have him in me, but just to look at him. It is Giardia. Um, he's so cute. So on the left is the Giardia trophozoid stage, and we call him the old man because he looks like he's staring at you. 
and he's a nice little pear shape. On the right is the Giardia cyst, and I always think, especially the one on the very right, looks like a tulip or a flower on the inside of it because it's got a stem, two leaves, and little petals. That's how I would draw a flower. <laughs> so I always know that it's the Giardia cyst because of that kind of look it has there. Giardia, of course, very much around the United States, coming from contaminated water, especially well water, lots of diarrhea with it. Yes, very good. This is Iota Amoeba bushlii. It has that large glycogen vacuole in it, which is such a unique feature. Um, so it is part of the amoeba. It's not really harmful that much, but it definitely is known for that large glycogen vacuole. So again, it is Giardia. Yep. Good. The Giardia cyst. Yeah, so this is Blastocystis hominis. Blastomyces is a fungus, very similar, but you knew what it would be if you had multiple choice, so that's all that matters. So Blastocystis hominis, this is known to have the nuclei on the edges of the parasite. So like when you look at it here, the nuclei are on the edges of the cyst. And that is because it has a middle central body that kind of pushes them toward that. So we've always said it blasts them to the outside walls. Um, so Blastocystis. So it is Entamoeba hartmani, so one of the amoebas, very little, little guy, um, not really, doesn't move very well, very sluggish movement. I always look at it like with a little dark, dark nuclei look to it. Um, that's not necessarily a unique feature. You'd have to go more by size on this one. But yeah, Entamoeba hartmani. I think I, this is a newer picture for you guys that I found. Yes, it is Isospora belli. Um, so it's not the exact same picture we've always been using. I found another picture to give you. So Isospora belli. I found a picture of this too. I didn't have this before, but I'm glad I found one that kind of represented it better. Um, the one on the right is probably the best one. The one on the very right, that's probably the best looking version of this. I don't know if you guys look at this. I will give you a hint. What it's pointing to inside that on the right one is a shepherd's crook. You can see it there. If, hopefully you know what you're talking about, this little shepherd crook thing inside. Yeah, so that should hopefully ring a bell as being chylomastix, mesmally. So chylomastix, I never had the greatest picture of it before, um, but it is a flagellate. So in the same family as Giardia, it is a flagellate. So in the cyst, Stage, it has this like little shepherd's crook. Sometimes they say it has like a lemon look. Like if you look at the bottom one, it kind of has that more lemon look with that little knob protrusion at one end, a little tiny bit. So those are some of the features it may look like. And then in the flagellate or trophozoic form, it, it's pear shaped, but it's not going to look just like Giardia. It definitely looks different. Good. It is a tenia egg. So remember, you have two tenias. You have saginata and solia. They look identical. You can't tell them apart from looking at them. You just call it a tenia egg. Um, they are coming from contaminated meat. So tenia saginata is from por um, no, por beef, cows, and tenia solium is coming in from pigs or pork, tapeworms. So they are tapeworms. So these are the eggs of that tapeworm, so tenia. The other thing that um, tenia solium especially is known as causing that cysticercosis where it can go up into the brain. Again, CDC has whole parasite sections um, and they have a page on that there, so.
So yeah, this would be our Entamoeba coli or E. coli parasite, um, known to have up to eight nuclei, which is very unique compared to the other amoebas in the cyst form. So there is a bunch in here. You'd have to focus your microscope up and down. Good. This is Plasmodium falciparum specifically because it is at crescent or banana shaped gametocyte stage. It's the only Plasmodium that looks like this in the gametocyte stage. So Plasmodium falciparum, perfect. Good. It is Trichinella spiralis. So very much known for that spiral shape. This is the one we can get out of like muscle biopsies, which is different because most of these parasites we're looking at stool stuff for, for causing, besides like malaria and babesi, of course, a lot of that is stool stuff, but this one can come out of muscle biopsies coming from raw pork, so trichinella. I just drew a blank on what I put here. Oh, I remember what it is. I think this is a new picture for you guys. It's how fun I made this like two years ago. I have to remember what I even made. I put a new picture. It is a worm. It is a hookworm egg. So remember, we have two hookworms, Nicator americanus and Ancylostoma duomily. Um, they are identical. You just call it a hookworm egg. You can't tell if it's Nicator americanus versus Ancylostoma duomily. I know which one you're talking about, Dallas, and a lot of people guess that one, and you're going to see that one soon. Um, but I know I knew which one you're meaning because I've had students guess that one a lot in the past because it does look similar. But once you see the other one, you'll see the difference. So, all right. So this is a hookworm egg. Good. This one is Dicilobrophium latum coming from like fish. So one of the keys is it has this little perculum cap at the one end that it's pointing to, but Dicilobrophium latum from fish. So this is just a soma, but it's not Mansoni. It is hematobium. So just a soma hematobium is the one that has the end or terminal spine. I always think of the T of terminal for the T in hematobium. I know it's random, but that's what helps me. So yeah. Just Mansoni and Japonicum would have side spines. Japonicum is very tiny, but Mansoni's is very obvious. But yeah, this one's Schistosoma hematobium. This is the one, um, Schistosomas can be found in the blood for infection, but this one can also be found in the urine because it loves to be in the, um, right above the bladder in the blood, in the vein or artery there. And so sometimes it can travel down into get into the urine as well. Not the best picture, but I think you you guys have seen this picture before. All right, this is Entamoeba histolytica. Yes, good. Entamoeba histolytica again it has one ingested red cell here, which I know it's hard to see that little black blob there. It's got two nuclei. The other thing it has here, this bigger, longer oval thing, is a chromatoid body, which it can have in there. Sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't. 
Here's the one that you were thinking about, Dallas. Um, that a lot of people think about when I said the hookworm one, people tend to think about this one. Anybody remember this one? I don't know how to spell it. Yeah. Um, yep, Sophia got it. They're pretty close. Dipolidium canum. Perfect. So it's a packet of eggs. Um, so this is coming off of like a lot of times contaminated fleas from dogs. So dipolidium canum. Oh, goodness. What did I call this one? I know what I think I called this one. This one should be Lucaria again. I'm going to go and verify because I hate to tell you. Yeah, it is Lucaria again. That's what I thought because it does not go down to the tip of the tail here. There's a big, long, extra part to it. So it doesn't go all the way down to the tip of the tail. So this is, again, Lucaria bancrofti. Not trick. People do ask that one a lot on this one. It's not trick. It is in the flagellate grouping. It's one that we haven't seen a ton. It's the chylomastix. Again, I know we didn't see a lot of the pictures in the regular class of it because it was just hard to find some good pictures of it. Um, but this is chylomastix, and that's only the trophozoic form of it. All right, good. This one is Strongyloides sericoralis. Yep, usually passed as a larvae instead of an egg. Yeah, it is in the Hymenolepis family. So this one is Diminuta, whereas there is going to be a Hymenolepis nana that we're going to get to. So this one's Hymenolepis Diminuta, no polar filament, so it's kind of nice and clear in the surrounding area here, shell. There's our trick. Oh my goodness. Trichomonas. Nice undulating membrane down the side of it. That waving membrane down the side is the key on this. Um, otherwise, the other, the more common way that we all look for trick is, of course, in those wet mounts, wet preps, or urine. And you can't see it up this close and stained. This is stained and really cool, zoomed in. But yeah, you can see it, and it has that like darting or jerking movement quality to it. So it doesn't swim along nicely. It's like jerk, 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 jerk. So if you guys got to see it, you'll kind of have noticed that. Yeah, so this is trypanosoma. Um, there's a few different trypanosomas. They look almost identical. This one is supposed to be trypanosoma cruzi. But the Trypanosoma brucei looks pretty much the same. I think they all look like little sea, like little seahorses. I think they're so cute. Um, so Trypanosoma cruzi is the one that causes Chagas disease coming from the Reduvid or kissing bug. And then the Trypanosoma brucei are the ones that are linked with sleeping sickness coming from the CC fly. And they mainly are in Africa. So you have Trypanosoma brucei, Rhodocyans, and Gambians as causing the sleeping sicknesses from the CC fly.
Yeah, so this is your hymenal lepus nana. It's hurt. This one isn't stained the way the diminutive one was stained earlier, but it does have the polar filament in the shell here. Um, the other one was stained, and this one isn't. That's why it looks different. And this is another good favorite. Trichira, trichiris, trick, trick. <laughs> um, so the key feature, of course, is the plugs on each end. I always said it has looked like a casserole dish to me, like they look like candles, but they're plugs on each end. Um, trichira, trichiris is the whipping worm. And so literally the worm itself looks like a whip. So I've always said you whip yourself up a casserole to kind of remember that. Good. This was that new one we put in earlier. Yep, is a scarus lumbricoides, that nice bumpy shell that it has, the round worm. Good. This one is your schistosoma mansoni with the big, large lateral spine. Yes, this is trichomonas, nice undulating membrane down the side of them again, good. So this is isosporabelli, again, we saw a picture of it earlier. So isosporabelli can either have, I think they call this a sporozoite inside of it. They can either have one or they can have two like in the picture we saw earlier. All right, at this point, I do have to pause because I got to jump onto that lovely mandatory meeting. Um, so we are going to take a pause in the recording, which I will do. Now. Okay, so we will keep going on our parasites here. What do we have here? It is Enterobius vermicularis, which is the pinworm. Very good. Did anybody get to see pinworms? I don't think they're, they're not done that often, but anyway, I don't think so, probably. No. And oh, I keep hoping somebody's gonna come in with pinworms. Nobody does. Um, so, of course, the technique that we've all discussed with pinworms is the scotch tape method. Um, or they have what we call pinworm paddles, basically the same principle, sticky, so that they can stick around the anal area because that's where they like to lay the eggs. And then you look at a microscope and you look for this little nice wormy. Of course, the key characteristics of enterobius or the pinworm is that it has kind of a slightly flattened one side to it. Look there. I guess I never was concerned about my daughter on that. <laughs> All right. So I would only be concerned if they're really digging in that area, I would say. <laughs> okay. This is Giardia again, our little old man. Good. I did throw in a new slide here, a new picture that we haven't had yet. All right, so this one is Paragonimus westermani. So Paragonimus is our one that we call the lung fluke, and so we can screen for it in sputum. So it is the one that can be found in sputum, Paragonimus.
Yeah, it's very good. This is Clonorchis sinensis, which is our Chinese liver fluke. Good, this is B. coli, Balancidium coli. Um, again, known for the very large kidney bean shaped macronucleus that it has. Yeah, it's definitely leash mania again here. All right, so the rest of these slides are information and I think they're just really nice because each of them will go and go over the main groups and give the features of the groups. Just a nice like quick reference sheet. So the amoebas are all on this slide here. I'll try to zoom it in for you guys. Um, actually, we can just do this. Let me put it as a whole slide there. So here's the amoebas in the trophozoite and the cyst stage, their different characteristics. So Entamoeba histolytica, of course, is the main pathogen out of the bunch. I said the rest of them aren't something that we worry that much about. Entamoeba histolytica is the only one that can really move extremely well in the trophozoite form. The rest of them don't really move or have a great motility. Also, Entamoeba histolytica is the only one that can contain red blood cells, ingested red blood cells, which I mentioned earlier. So that's here, none of the rest can. Um, so it just kind of goes through those. Again, cyst stage, entamoeba coli is the only one that can have up to eight nuclei in a cyst, the rest don't. Entamoeba bushley at the bottom there has that single defined glycogen vacuole that's very characteristic for its cyst stage. So it gives some good information there and kind of comparison and contrast. There's the flagellate slide. So it kind of goes through Giardia, Chylomastix, Trichomonas, and Diantamoeba. Again, Diantamoeba is a flagellate. It looks like a amoeba, but it's not. Um, so it kind of goes through each one of those. So I talked about the cyst of Chylomastix being that lemon shape, has a shepherd's crook. Oh, they don't talk about the shepherd crook on this slide, but it does. Um, Trichomonas is the one that has that undulating membrane on the one side, that kind of wavy membrane, jerky motility. I said. I had mentioned that earlier, so that kind of stuff there. Malaria species are there, all the different comparisons. That's, again, a crossover between micro and heme. Here are the flukes. So you have your fasciola hepatica, fasciolopsis busky. Again, they are identical eggs. It even says it over in here. Paragonimus, which is our sputum, lung fluke. Clonorchus, which is liver. Um, you have heterophys, heterophys, and metagonomus yakagawa. Those two eggs look alike. They didn't even give a drawing here, and I've never shown you the eggs either, so obviously I'm not very worried. They look very similar to Clonorca sinensis, but um, we're not worried about the look of them. And then there's schistosomas, of course, as well here. Tapeworm, so you got your Dicylobrothium latum, Tania, Hymenolepesis, and Dipylidium canum. And then your worms. Roundworm is a scarus. Then you have Enterobius vermicularis, which is your pinworm. Trichuris trichura, which is your whipworm. And then you have the hookworm egg. Again, there is two types of hookworms, but they look identical, so they just say hookworm. And then the strongyloides sericoralis is on the slide as well. So you got some nice comparisons there. And then of course those microfilariae, which is the Wicaria, brugia, loa, loa. I'm not worried about the rest of them. So nice little comparisons of features on each. Use what you want. You don't have to worry about the size, just classification of parasites in general. Um, this one's nice, though. I did make this um, so that you can know what vectors go with certain, some of these. Leishmania is passed by the sandfly. Plasmodium is mosquito. Babesia is tick. Trypanosoma cruzi is that reduvid bug. Trypanosoma brucei is the cc. Wicaria and brucea are mosquito. Loa loa and Oncocerica are flies. That's kind of a nice, handy little vector chart to have as well to remind yourself. Okay, so that was a lot of info on parasites. Let's switch over to mycology. And again, I did the same thing here. I added a few different fungi that we hadn't really discussed in class, but I do want you to know for boards, and maybe you've heard of some of these from Media Lab, so we will find out. So, 
we are going to go through it here. Let's see. What do you guys have? Yep, this one's fun. It's penicillium. Looks like that wheatgrass or paintbrush look. Ah, this is one of the new ones. I don't know if anybody knows this from their Media Lab. I know I've had students in the past know it from Media Lab. A lot of people do think it's glucosum, and it's not. It's not epidermophyton. That's a good guess, though. Yes, it does start with an A. So I think Dallas, you might have had a question on it. Is alternaria? So I'm going to spell it out here in the chat. So this is one that I'm going to kind of add in just for um, purpose of boards. So it is an opportunistic fungi. So it's very similar to penicillium and fusarium. It will cause infection when it can, and it has the right circumstances. So it's opportunistic. Um, it's said to have what they call an acropetal shape. That's what they call the shape of each one. I think it looks like, because one of my students said in the past, and I agree, it looks like little mice in a row following each other, like little mice. Oh, they're so cute. Um, thank God it's not really mice <laughs> in a row following each other, but that's kind of what I think it looks like, but they call it an acropetal shape. This right here, and it's also, this is not stained, by the way. This is its natural pigment. So it's what we call dematiaceous. Um, hyaline means non-pigmented, dematiaceous means naturally pigmented. So it does have a natural pigment to it. So it does look like this without being stained. And I think I have another slide in here on alternaria, so you get to practice it again. So this is our fusarium, very much that banana sickle shell, sickle cell look to it. Fusarium, so an opportunistic fungi. Yeah, so this is going to be aspergillus. I believe I was going for aspergillus niger here. Yep, an entire head covered in spores. Yeah, it's good. And aspergillus is also an opportunistic fungi. Yep, very good. Aesporothrichtenkii. This is the first of our systemic fungi. So it is in the systemic group, can, meaning it can cause an all over infection. But mainly we know it as rose gardener's disease. So coming from handling roses, if they prick themselves with a thorn or whatever, they can get a subcutaneous infection. So it can start as just a subcutaneous infection, but it can spread. It is also a dimorphic fungi. Good, yes. So we have five, at least for sure five that we're going to discuss. I'm going to add a sixth one in today, but here we go again. So okay, yep. Like I was saying, Sporothrix shanky um, part of the dimorphic fungi. So. Dimorphic fungi, again, yeast can occur, it can be both a yeast and a mold phase. The yeast tending to occur in the body temperature range, 35 to 37 degrees Celsius, the mold in the room temperature type range. Okay, so, and the key with sporothrix, but you guys already know this, is it kind of clusters at the tip there. So I think it looks like a little daisy almost. Okay, so this one is your epidermophyte and flacosum. Yep, so 
So this is the one that we call the club shape or beaver tail. And this, in the, of course, the stain right here, but yeah, epiderma phyton flaccosa, it is a skin infection. And that's what it can cause. So nice big club or beaver tail look. Yeah, good. The germ tube test looking for candida albicans. Nice. Good. Fusarium again. Nice little canoe shape. Perfect. This is penicillium again, the wheatgrass or paintbrush look. Yep, aspergillus, in this case, this would be fumigatus, which is like farmer's lawn, they call it. Again, it's just uh, um, opportunistic. Oh, you got to see one of these. Oh, you did too, nice. Did you guys recognize it right away? Yay, <laughs> good, it's even better when you know it. <laughs> good, perfect, oh, I'm so glad. Oh, I guess it makes sense. Um, I don't know if you ever got the clinical background on the patient, but it'd be interesting to know like what they came in with, what their demographic was, that kind of thing, like symptoms they had. I always like to piece it together. <laughs> Yeah, so this is Aspergillus niger. Oh, Dallas, it was a 25-year-old from an ear swab. Oh, that's fun. Not for the patient, but for us. That's interesting. The heck do they do to their ears? <laughs> well, that would make sense if they're a farmer or something. It's, no snow is out there anymore, so they can be stirring stuff up out of the soil. Good. All right, so this was Aspergillus niger. All right. Yeah, so this is another dimorphic fungi. Good, a systemic infection. All the dimorphic fungi can cause a systemic infection. So histoplasma capsulata. The key is the rough, yep, tuberculated look to it. They like to call it tuberculated, I just say rough. Macrocanidia, it's kind of spiky looking almost. Yep, very good, you guys. This is Microsporum canis. So it has that really spindle or pointy end to it versus the Microsporum gypsium, which has a bit of a more rounded end to it. But this is Microsporum canis, known for causing ringworm. Okay, so this one, oh, there we go. Yeah, it's Blastomyces dermatitis, so another dimorphic fungi. This is the yeast phase of it. So it's really known to have that thick walled to it, look to its yeast phase, the Blastomyces dermatitis. In the fungi, or in the mold stage, it has a lollipop look, that Blastomyces dermatitis. Good. So it is Paracoccidioides brasiliensis, um, again, a dimorphic fungi. And so it's said to have that mariner, mariner's wheel appearance. So I would say you're sailing to Brazil. Paracoccidioides brasiliensis. Good. 
Good. There is your epidermophyte and flexcostum, that beaver tail or club shape. You guys got that now. Nice. Yeah, you guys are good. Coccidioides imitus, again, a dimorphic fungi. I think we've hit all the five now, main ones that we've learned. Um, this is the valley fever one. So this is a big one down in like Arizona region that they have to deal with. This is also the one that's really contagious. Like they say to use sealed, seal the plate kind of thing for healthcare workers. It's not gymstium, it is microsporum canis. Yeah, it's more pointy on the end still. So microsporum canis. Ah, I added a new one. I wonder if you guys know this from Media Lab. Not coccidioides, that's a good guess because I can see the squares. I see what you were doing there. I definitely can tell that, but not that. Would you guys know it if I said spaghetti and meatball appearance? Does that mean anything to anyone? Sometimes people get questions on this, so I want to see. Ah, yes, Malaysia furfur. Yes, okay. So Malaysia furfur is a yeast that has this spaghetti meatball appearance under the microscope, which is what we're seeing here. But it is a very um, pathogenic yeast. So Malaysia furfur. I don't know, I always think of furry spaghetti on that, by the way. It's stupid, <laughs> but it works. Mm. You guys had this earlier. Yeah, germ tube for candida, good. It looks really big in this picture, doesn't it? Germ tube test for candida albicans. Yeah, there's our coccidioides imitus again. Nice. Yeah, at first when people look at this, they're like, what am I looking at? But if you look at the individual ones, it is fusarium. You can see the nice little sickle shaped look to it. It looks like a bunch of bananas hanging there all together. Yeah. All right, nice. Sporothrochanchii clustering at the tip. Very good, you guys. Nice. Aspergillus niger. Yeah. Definitely histoplasma capsulatum. It really looks spiky there. Yep, Aspergillus fumigatus. No, not Candida. Yep, this is that Malaysia fur fur again. Spaghetti and meatball. So it's a different yeast. Candida is a yeast as well. 
but Malay's here for, for a good uh, furry spaghetti. Yeah, so that's that new one that we had in the beginning, Alternaria. Um, again, I always think it looks like mice following each other. Naturally pigmented, so not stained here. So Alternaria. There's our microsporum gypsum. Yes, more of a rounded end to it. Good. Oh, finally. Okay. People are going to guess coccidioides on this. It is not. It's very similar looking to coccidioides. This is a new one that I added in. And I, yep, I knew somebody would have this out of the microbiology section. It is geotrichum. It is another opportunistic fungi, so same category as Alternaria, Penicillium, Fusarium, opportunistic, so Geotrichum. So I can write that out here. It'll also be on the answer sheet, of course, that I send you. So it's just another one to know. I always think of Geo for geometry, I don't know, very square. It is very similar looking to Carcidioides, though, so I do know, understand people get them confused. Looks kind of like grandpa's rods, like the bacillus almost. Okay. That one got wild looking. Oh, that is penicillium. It grew its hair out. It got extensions. I don't know. <laughs> it's penicillium. That's not the best picture, but go to 10. Yep, you guys got it. Um, this one is Microsporum gypsum. It almost did look club shape on a couple of them, but it is the Microsporum gypsum. Good. Yeah, so that's that new one, Geotrichum again. All right, good, you guys. It is Paracoccidioides brasiliensis. It just had a lot of spokes on the wheel this time, but yes, Paracoccidioides brasiliensis. Okay, so this one we haven't had yet. This is, oh, well, you guys already know it, never mind. But for those that don't know it right away, maybe they didn't get to do it or see it, this is an India ink stain identifying Cryptococcus neoformans. So everything in the background stained, like that brown coloring, but the Cryptococcus, remember, has a capsule, so the stain can't get in there. So the Cryptococcus kind of shines like halo effect like this. Um, and so that's how they identify it. Cryptococcus neoformans, this is the India ink stain. Oh, crypto coin, yeah. These look like coins. That's a good way to remember it. I never thought, I never heard that before. That is a good tip. Crypto coin. All right, yes, we have our furry spaghetti again, Malaysia fur fur. This one's, a, it's kind of zoomed out, but there's a little meatballs and then all the spaghetti. Yeah, Malaysia fur fur. It's a tough one sometimes. Yeah, this one is, it's, I wish it was a little bit bigger, but yeah, Epidermophyte and Flacosum, the club shape.
And this is the alternaria again. So it's nice to see those back to back. So the epidermophyte and flood costum club shape, which has to be stained versus alternaria, which is naturally this pigmented color. But and then see how it just kind of follows right, right along attached to each other like that versus the flacosa. So it's kind of nice to see the two side by side because they have a similar shape. Yeah, alternating okay, stripes, patterns. It is a yeast phase, and it's the yeast phase of, yep, Blastomyces dermatitis, that very thick walled yeast phase of the Blastomyces dermatitis. Oh, this is such a good picture of this. That is so pretty. Look at all the little flowers. It's sporothrexanchii. Very good. See, it definitely just clusters right at the tip. That's not the prettiest of the pictures, but. Uh, I was waiting to see which one people would go with. I thought for a second, oh, they're gonna say penicillium because it definitely looks like penicillium because it kind of got a little wild looking. It is supposed to be aspergillus. It's a little bit bigger than penicillium, but yeah, I definitely almost thought that same thing. So I got why you guys said that for sure. Good. Yep, this is our last picture, Coccidioides imitus. Yes, Coccidioides imitus. All right. Fungi are always a little bit more fun than parasites, I feel. Okay, now one last thing that we're going to go through before we are done. Just some, a few notes here, and I again will send this sheet to you, so don't worry if you don't want to write it down. Some things that you should know. So there is a test question that I've used in the past. I know it's in your board study guide book, or it was at one point. It might be even in Media Lab. They might ask you to say, which of the following can you not use or can you use for quality control purposes? Remember, there are certain parasite eggs that look identical. So if you had to do like QC, you can't tell these apart so they wouldn't work for quality control stuff because they look alike. You can't tell them apart by looking at them. The tenia cilium and tenia saginata, remember, look alike. Heterophase, heterophase, and metagonomus yakagawa look alike. I know we didn't look at pictures of them, but you have to remember they look identical. Fasciola hepatica and fasciolopsis busky look identical. And then the hookworm eggs, which again are Anthosoma duodenale and Nicator americanus. That's why we just say hookworm egg when we see it. So all of these do look identical. The dimorphic fungi, again, can be dimorphic because they have a yeast phase at body temp, a mold phase at room temp, and they all cause systemic diseases. So we've already looked at pictures and talked about these five. These are the five I want you to know. Remember, sporothrix is the one that fits into both subcutaneous and systemic disease categories. The sixth one I'm going to add on is penicillium marnefii. Most penicilliums are opportunistic and don't cause us that much harm. Penicillium marnefii, though, is considered a dimorphic fungi that can cause a systemic disease. You do not need to know this for the Friday's exam. You just need to know for board. So anything new that I added on today, like alternaria, geotrichum, malaysia for, for penicillium marnefii, don't need to know for Friday's exam. You just need to remember for boards. And you guys have already started seeing those questions anyway on the lab, Media Lab CE site, so that's helping. Remember meningitis, there were certain ones that like to occur at certain age groups, strep A, galactia, listeria, or your newborn meningitis, Haemophilus influenzae type B is your youngest, like two to six year olds, Neisseria meningitis is teenage group, and strep pneumonia does cause a meningitis, and that's your older population, like 60 and above. There is a vaccine for that one as well, they call it pneumococcal vaccine, and they call the Neisseria meningitis one meningococcal vaccine. So. And then smells, again, we don't smell plates, but if you get a description of a smell, um, I don't remember what Citrobacter smells like. I haven't seen a Citrobacter in years myself. So, great tortilla tends to be Pseudomonas, musty or mushroom smelling is Passerella, bleach is Iconella cordans, 
mousy with Haemophilus, dirt-like smells, Burkholderia sapacea, a fruity strawberry smell with alkaligens, and ammonia smell with Stenotropha monos mosophilia. And then apparently Citrobacter will just say yucky. <laughs> and Proteus, yucky, <laughs> all of them. And then this was those cards that I kind of talked about on Monday in the chemistry group when I showed you on Amazon website. They're listed here, so if you didn't get the name or you wanted to look them back up, that's the name of them there. All right. So, I again will send you the recording link as soon as I have it available. It takes quite a while for it to become available.